and uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the ninth International Symposium on Forest and Sustainable Development in Brasov, Romania. I would like to ask you to mute your mics during the opening sessions to avoid any interference. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the current ed edition of this symposium will take place entirely online. We had to adapt to the new global conditions and to move all activities in the virtual room. However, we are happy that we could organize this symposium as scheduled on 16th of October. Of course, we would have liked to welcome you in person to our university and to the city of Brasov. We sincerely hope that the general situation will improve in the next months and you all have a chance to enjoy the beauty of Brasov and of the surrounding forest in the Carpathians. Now, I would like to uh, introduce Professor Jan Vasile Abrudan, the rector of the Transylvania University of Brasov, of Brasov, who will deliver an opening address. Professor Abrudan, please take the floor. Thank you, Lucian. Good morning, everyone. And uh, on behalf of Transylvania University of Brasov, the largest university in central Romania and the most prestigious Romanian higher education institution in the field of forestry, I would like to welcome you all to the ninth edition of the International Symposium for Forest and Sustainable Development. Uh, almost two decades ago, when we discussed and decided to adopt a permanent title for our biennial symposium, Forest and Sustainable Development, it was hard to foresee the complexity of the challenges the forestry sector would face. The realities of the last decades forced our sector, forestry, to consider and include in its daily practice new concepts like biodiversity conservation, climate change, carbon cycle, social respons responsibility, etc. And who knows what will follow in the next decades. Therefore, adaptation, and I underline this word, adaptation, and I mean here the way the forestry, higher education and research are capable to adapt to the needs and demands of society, is a key word for the present and at least near future. We also have to be more open and proactive regarding the changing society needs and be more active in cooperating and working together with other sectors. I hope that the presentations and discussions during this international symposium, even if online due to the special pandemic situation we are going through, will be a good opportunity not only to present the results of your recent research, but also to identify new research topics and partnership for the benefit of the forestry sector and also our societies. I wish you all a successful symposium, good health for you and your family, and look forward to seeing you all in Brasov in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Professor Abrudan for the welcome address and uh, you are very right indeed adaptability is very important in the current situation and uh, if someone is not able to adapt of course uh, it will be not good for him or her. Yeah, um, the current edition as it was said is the ninth edition of this biennial International Symposium organized by the Faculty of Silviculture of Forest Engineering in Brasov. The first edition took place in October 2004. And I would like to thank Professor Abrudan for being the initi initiator of this series of international symposia, which are organized every two years in Brasov by our faculty. This edition was organized uh, in close cooperation with uh, the International Union of Forest Research Organization, Organizations, UFRO, and a major role in this 
very good cooperation was played by our colleague Bogdan Strumbu, professor at Oregon State University College of Forestry. Bogdan, uh, please take the floor. Thank you, Lucian. Thank you very much. Uh, like with any piece of technology, there will be some hiccups every so often. So let's see if we can get these things together. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. I hope that you see the right screen, not the, the wrong screen. So what I'm right. going to be speaking with you just for a couple of minutes is a description of the International Union of Forty Research Organization, which is the global non-profit, non-governmental, and non-discriminatory scientific organization focused on forestry. This organization is the home of around 15,000 scientists with many, many voluntary office holders. So everybody who is an office holder uh, in IUFRO is a voluntary. There is no uh, monetary involvement of all of us. There are more than 600 member organizations and there are many, many research units. Pretty much all of all the countries across the world are member in or participating in IUFRO and there are more than 70 meters every year. IUFRO is open to all individuals and organizations and is dedicated to research and the research in forestry and forest product. Now IUFRO is more than 100 years old and is based in Vienna, Austria. The missions of IUFRO is to advance research and knowledge sharing as well as to foster development of science-based solutions to forest-related challenges to the benefits of forest and people worldwide exactly align with uh, what uh, Professor Abrodan said at the beginning of the conference. There are five teams that basically frame the entire organizations, which today are forest for people, forest and climate change, forest and forest-based products, biodiversity ecosystem services and biological invasions, and forest soils and water interaction. There are nine divisions that all of them work on those five goals, and those nine divisions, I'm not gonna read them, but they range from silviculture, which is now the mother disciplines of all the foresters, range all the way to forest policy and economics. The divisions are separated into research groups and the research groups basically is, are a uh, sub-small unit of the division that focus more the research. The number of research groups in each divisions vary from, for example, 10 in division one to four in division eight. Now within each research group, there are actually working parties, and the working parties are basically those cells, you can call them, elementary units that actually ensure that the objectives and goals of IUFRO are carried out. For example, the research group uh, 403 the, have uh, three working parties, and the 101 has 12 research groups, okay, uh, 12 working parties. Now there are three working parties in the research group 403, which is basically the organization that help organizing this event. And there are, those are intelligence analysis in forest models, machine learning and computational ecology, which is the unit involved in this event and the information and management in information technology. And with that, I will like to see you to the next event. If you do not know, the next IUFRO Forestry Congress will be in Sweden, and I hope that I will going to see you there. And with that, I would like to hear your presentation here. Thank you very much, Bogdan, for uh, your presentation about IUFRO and for your support in organizing this international conference. The conference will be will begin with the plenary session in which we invited six renowned scientists from different disciplines to present their research findings 
on topics of interest to the broad forestry community. I would like to thank them very much for sharing their research with us today. In the afternoon, we will be continuing with five thematic sessions. The first one is forest ecosystem management. For forest, then we have forest engineering, wildlife management, geomatics, and informatics, modelings, and modeling and statistics. There are in total 46 oral and 31 poster presentations given by speakers from 18 different countries from four continents. We realize that for several participants from abroad, the local time is late or very early, and we highly appreciate their efforts to join the sessions and to deliver their presentations. We are happy to see 12 contributions signed by international teams, as the authorship consists of researchers from more than one country. We are very pleased to have PhD, master and bachelor students among the authors of the presentations, since they will be the future of the forestry sector. During virtual coffee breaks, uh, please visit also the poster gallery on the symposium website and uh, you will have the possibility to choose the best poster on our Facebook official page, the official page of the Faculty of Civic Culture and Forest Engineering. The scientific committee will also perform an evaluation of the poster presentations and by combining the results of both evaluations, the best poster of the conference will be awarded. A premiere for this conference series. So for the first time, the presentations in the plenary session are live streamed to YouTube and to the Facebook page of our faculty. In this way, making research results available to a broader assist audience. I would like to thank all keynote speakers for their approval in this respect. I would also like to mention that the book of abstracts was uploaded on the conference website. After the conference, there are two deadlines for submitting the papers presented in the conference for publication in the proceedings volume or in the special issue Forest and Sustainable Development, which will be published in the journal Forests. Of course, all manuscripts will undergo a review process. The submission deadlines for the conference volume is end of October, and uh, the deadline for the submissions in Forest is end of November. The volume will be available, I mean the conference volume, the proceedings will be available in January 2021 and will be sent for indexing in international databases. Thank you to all participants who already submitted their work for publication. We wish this conference to be an excellent platform for the exchange of uh, scientific knowledge on the latest developments in forestry and related fields. And regardless of your particular areas of interest, we hope that our conference will encourage you to expand your interests in a broad array of research topics in forest science and develop new relationships. I would like to express our sincere gratitude to all speakers 
I extend my thanks to all members of the organizing and scientific committee for their work and genuine interest to make this symposium successful. And I warmly thank you all for your kind participation. I hope that you will find it beneficial for your future work. I wish you all a successful conference. And now I would like to ask my colleague Victor to take the floor. He will be moderating the plenary session. So Victor, please. Welcome everybody to this nice international symposium, Forest and Sustainable Development. We'll start the plenary session with the presentation of uh, a Spanish and French uh, team, which uh, are uh, at the top of the uh, genetics research, uh, as you might uh, know. The presenter will be Dr. Uh, Santiago Gonzalez Martinez. And the team is uh, made up of uh, uh, four uh, researchers, two from uh, France and two from, from Spain. Uh, so we, the collaborators of, Professor, of Dr. Gonzalez Martinez are uh, Dr. Scotti, Ivan Scotti, also from uh, the Institut National de Recherche, Recherche Agronomique de, de France, uh, and uh, uh, two colleagues from uh, the INEA, uh, Spain. Uh, they will uh, present something about using genomics for um, uh, conservation purposes. So uh, I will uh, ask uh, Dr. Santiago Gonzalez to uh, start his presentation. Okay. C can you hear me now? Yes, we can, can hear you, you quite well. Okay, thank you so much. So, so sorry for, for these issues that we uh, don't know what will have been the problem. I just changed the, the browser and now it seems to work. So, so as I was saying, thank you so much for this invitation to present here our work. Uh, what I'm presenting is, uh, uh, here is, a, is a, some of, uh, a summary of the efforts we are doing to uh, use genomic data to, uh, to, to improve conservation and management of forage genetic resources. And this is a collaboration between um, two teams that we, we often work together. And it's the INRAE from Bordeaux, uh, that is myself, Santiago Gonzalez Martinez, and the INRAE from Avignon, that is Ivan Scotti, and two colleagues from, from the INEA in Madrid, in Spain, Ricardo Alia and Delphine Duibet. So to, to start, just uh, like we have to, um, uh, I'm going to start with some basic principles uh, about what is uh, how local adaptation takes place. So basically local adaptation happens when we have selection that adds in phenotypic traits that are editable and that produces a difference uh, when it, there is a selection driver that produces a difference in, in fitness, a difference in uh, the contribution to the next generation that will make, uh, that produce change, produce evolutionary change uh, responding to this em environmental driver. And this takes normally uh, a, a time, uh, this takes time, that normally doesn't happen from one generation to the next, but it normally takes uh, uh, multiple generations, in particular when environmental change takes place across a large area. So, uh, our question, and, and, and this is most, uh, is what we are trying to do in, in my lab and also with other colleagues, is like how to use genomic data uh, to, uh, to understand better the process of, of genetic adaptation and in, in, in particular to, to mitigate the effects of climate change, because very obvious solution to climate change would be for this would be able to adapt genetically by itself. And now we are in a very exciting situation because we have a lot of genomic data in forestry, so it's getting easier to generate this data. We have some international networks for conservation, like uh, the Network Genetic Conservation Unit, so the UFO gene. Uh, as you can see, there is many, many conservation units in, here in Romania, but they are a bit uh, for all species, a bit everywhere, and that's Kisnus, uh, San, uh, 
some facilities and dispositive for population that are important for conservation with, with which we can work. And we have also a number of European projects and big initiatives like Evo Tree, Gene Tree, uh, that, can be, that, yeah, that are used for, for addressing these topics. And the, the main question I say is like, how can we move from uh, descriptive, uh, uh, descriptive genetics to actually understanding the adaptive processes in the wild? But uh, we are working with forest trees. This is not Arabidopsis. This is not uh, humans, Drosophila. It's not uh, any of the traditional genetic uh, models. And we have a number of issues in forest trees that we don't have in other in other organisms. So the, the first thing is that in forest trees it's difficult to measure fitness. Uh, how we measure the contribution uh, of a tree to the next generation? How the potential for for adaptation is difficult because they are long lived organisms that they are uh, subject to many uh, selection processes. Uh, normally also in trees it's difficult to generate phenotypic data and um, very often we have only very basic data like growth, survival, etc. But we don't know much about how trees respond to uh, abiotic and biotic uh, factors like uh, disease. Uh, or we know, we know everything but it's difficult to generate this data. Also in trees, as they are long leaf, uh, we have uh, uh, it's normally not the same when you we work with uh, uh, small trees with uh, seedling saplings, or we we work with uh, adult trees. So so it's important to consider the stage of, of the ontogenic uh, stage at which the, the the our study is done. As I said, the long generation time is a complication for uh, for genetic studies. Uh, we have very good tools in, in trees to, to, to look for phenotypic uh, variation of genetic components that are common gardens. And, but these common gardens, uh, they are difficult to, to establish, uh, they are expensive, they need uh, to be uh, maintained for very long years in order to be useful. And then uh, they, have, they occupy normally this space, so it's quite, actually quite difficult to, to have good common gardens that are planted in many places. And, uh, and finally, from the genomic point of side, uh, the, uh, some of the, the three species that are more important for, uh, for forest trees, like, uh, for instance, the conifers, like Norway spruce, or the different species of pine, they have a very complex and large genome. And that makes things also difficult at the genomic level because it's much easier to work with a small, with a species with a small genomes. But despite all these limitations, there are a number of approaches and there are a number of, of uh, studies we can do that they will provide insights on how to use uh, uh, genomic information for conservation and for this management. And, and this is a summary of uh, uh, all the kind of approaches we can use and some of them they are commonly used already in uh, forest genetics and the others they, they are starting just, uh, they are starting now to be more popular. So we will start for these four, four group of approaches and I will put some examples for each of them. So the first one that I would say is the most classical one and uh, that is just trying to use genetics and genomics to quantify evolutionary processes that are associated with the persistence of the population. And then uh, uh, I have to say that there has been a very big change in the last uh, perhaps the last decade, the last 10 years, the last 15 years. So we have passed what we will used to call conservation genetics in forest trees uh, to what we call now conservation genomics. What is the difference? It's just a difference of scale. Uh, we were used to, to work with uh, just a handful of genetic markers. And now we have, uh, we have access to, to full genomes. We have access to, to much bigger data sets. Uh, and this allow uh, not only to have a better, better, more power to do the, any kind of genetic estimate we want to do, but also we have the access to, to genes and, uh, and region of the genome that, that are associated with quantitative traits. So we can have on one side what we call neutral markers, that are markers that are not related with traits, we are not affected by selection, and that's very useful to estimate like genetic diversity, demography, etc. But we have also a number of markers that we can say with quite security that, that they are the lagging, they, they are controlling uh, traits that have 
importance both for adaptation and for also uh, for for production, like growth. For, that's a good example. So, and this is how things have changed when we, we move from genetics to genomics. You can see in blue all, all the kind of things we can do, or we, we were used to do when, when we have just a handful of markers. So we could still say things about the loss of genetic diversity, uh, about population structure, about breeding. But there were a number of things that we were, were more were harder to, to assess, like uh, uh, we did not have any information about local adaptation coming from, from these molecular market studies. It was difficult to, to do some of these estimates. Uh, it was difficult, we, we did not have any, any uh, they, we didn't identify any region of the genome that were associated with different environmental traits. And, and now we can do that, uh, thanks to, the, to this boon in, in genomics that we are experiencing. Uh, this is, a, for instance, a case study, uh, something very important in, uh, in, uh, in natural tree populations is like the, the level of inbreeding depression. Uh, inbreeding depression just means that uh, when we have, uh, we can have a, a number of alleles that have a negative effect on the fitness of the, the tree, or they, or they can be bad for any kind of, of plastic tray we, we would like to to assess. And these deleterious alleles, when they are in homozygosity, they can have really, really, uh, they can produce important depression. And now we have methods using genomics that we will, that allow us to, to, to assess the genome, to, to make questions to the genome, to identify regions that have, they have, uh, that they are uh, too, uh, that have a lot of homozygosity, and that they, we can associate some of these regions, we can associate with important depression. And I, I will recommend you to have a look to this work uh, done in Eucalyptus. That is a really nice uh, study that is showing how uh, uh, they are identifying the regions of, of the genome that will have an excess of homozygosis respect with that they will be expected in, in normal circumstances. Uh, that's just an example. So, so that, that could be kind of like the traditional way of, of using markers, but, but now the, that Genome is what is bringing is, is more power and, and it's keep bringing the capacity to, to do more, more interesting things. Uh, another, another, another field that has started to be much better thanks to genomics is like uh, when we want to find signatures of, of selection and genetic adaptation. Uh, I have um, another paper I can recommend is this review for our colleagues in Switzerland. Uh, Christian Wester is the first author. And then you can see that here, uh, in this paper, uh, it's focusing what we call environmental association analysis. That is actually a way of connecting the, the genotype with the environment. So it's this line here. And then, and then this uh, we will see later that there are another kind of studies that what we try is to connect the genotype with the phenotype. And these studies, they are also uh, very interesting and useful because we, they allow us uh, to predict phenotypes and to use genotype peak information uh, coming from genomics, like uh, to replace the phenotype uh, in for some applications. So that uh, I will remind you that in these days it's much more difficult to get uh, accurate measurements of phenotypes that actually to produce a big uh, genomic data set. So in this review, there is, uh, you, there is many methods that, that they, are, uh, uh, they are designed to, 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 show, uh, to, to produce reliable estimates between genotype and environment. And basically how it works, uh, first you need, of course, to produce some genetic data in natural populations. Uh, you need to, to sample, uh, you have to measure environmental data that could be uh, yeah, yeah, there are some environmental data that is relatively easy to get because there are big uh, databases that are public, uh, like for instance, climate data is relatively easy to, to get. Uh, then you will need to do an intermediate step where you estimate population structure and when you try to find confounding factors that could disturb uh, the correlations between genotype and environment. And then what you will do is uh, to apply any kind of methods that they, they will associate uh, the allelic, allelic frequencies with the environmental data you have collected. So, so in principle, it's a, 
it's a simple conceptual approach that is more sophisticated when you, you work with it. But what, what is the objective of this analysis? And this is some work we, we are investing a lot of energy and time uh, in, in my lab. Uh, it's like the try to use then these correlations between genomics and environment to see how uh, how well adapted our natural populations to the future climate. And I will present here, this is the work of one of our PhD students, uh, Juliette uh, Alchambo, that she has done, established these correlations between genotype and environment for uh, mite and pine, the Pinus pinaster, that is a species that have a very important ecological and economical uh, value in the uh, in the southwestern um, in southwestern Europe. So I'm based here in Bordeaux, that is a, a place where we have a huge huge plantation. So this species, so it's a very important for the for the economy of of the region. And, and here what do the, what we have is the how um, this map, what is represented, is uh, the matching uh, between the current uh, allelic composition of these populations with the future climate. And the, the colors is meaning in, in blue is places where actually uh, populations are expected to be well adapted because they have the genes, uh, they have the, uh, the Y frequencies that uh, uh, all based in the correlations we have established that, that, that that's places that nothing will be happening basically but the other places and in particular in in, in our region here in bordeaux also in central spain northwestern spain a little bit in italy here where uh the the current populations of of of, of these species are not are very far genetically for what we will need to be uh in the future and, and this is normally in this case, for instance, it's very related to the precipitation, to the expected changes in precipitation for uh, under future climates, and that will. Uh, but but these uh, these these correlations they are helping us to think in uh, to prioritize uh, the, the management action to know in which uh, regions of the distribution of the species we should be. Uh, uh, doing then something very soon if we want them to to be adapted to the future climate conditions okay so another approach that uh, we are using genomics for but that actually this approach is very much by based on conventional quantitative genetics but we need to use uh, genomics for some of these steps that are necessary for for applying this approach and this approach is basically basically in uh, estimating the responses to selection in natural populations. Uh, these responses to selection, they follow the traditional, the classical Buides equation, but that when this is adapted to natural populations, it's better expressed like in this equation here, that is just the responses to selection is equal to the selection gradient and the genetic covariance matrix, multiplied by genetic covariance matrix. The genetic covariance matrix is just a a relaxed matrix across pairs of individuals, and the selection gradient is, we will see here, a selection gradient is how uh, relative fitness is changing compared with the, the, the trade values. So what we need to, to do these estimates of responses to selections, so we need to, on one side, like in, uh, if we go back to the equation, we need to estimate the selection gradient, we need to estimate the genetic covariance the matrix. And then it's useful also to estimate the stability because uh, these uh, changes have only persist in the population only. If there is a change in a trait, uh, we saw in the, the first slide, uh, it will only produce evolutionary change if it is editable. So, so you here, uh, here you are. So, so we need to combine selection gradients in, in natural conditions. Uh, with estimate of heritability in the field. And, and we have a, a rich literature of estimating heritability in common gardens, but uh, actually it's not the same because heritability is, is population specific. So it's not the same the heritability you can compute in a common garden that, that you will compute in, in a natural population. And for these two uh, parameters, we will need, we need to use genomics to do the, the estimates. So this, this is an example, selection gradient is just how this is how uh, fitness, in, in this case, estimated live reproductive success, 
is increasing with changes in a, in a particular phenotypic trait. So, so what would we need to do this, this uh, estimates for of population responses to, to selection? We, we need the uh, information on parentes or the learners between individuals to compute these uh, additive genetic covariance matrices. And for that, we can use markers. But to make a good estimate of, of this covariant matrix, genetic covariant matrix, we need a lot of markers. And that's where uh, genomics can be very, very useful. And what we don't have very well is actually on phenotypic data. So, so actually, uh, it's kind of a paradox because for, for a long time, we, we were focusing in, in machining traits. And, and then that was kind of this most of the classical studies on genetics are based, in, based on traits. Then they came the genomics. And, uh, and we have spent long years working on genomics, trying to, to produce methods to generate genomic information. And uh, once upon a time, it was hard to get genomic data. And now we're in a situation where producing the genomic data is very easy, very straightforward. And what is difficult is to have good traits and uh, understand how these traits are related with, with fitness. And another limitation, and, and it's something that worries me a lot, is like uh, it's very difficult to generalize using these approaches that look to particular responses to, to selection in, a, in populations. It's really difficult to, to generalize because they are very specific of, of, of the traits you are working with, the population, and actually the, the testing environment. So, so that makes things a bit hard, but this is a line where we, we are putting a lot of energy because it can give us a lot of information about how evolution takes place in natural population and how we can harness these processes to improve adaptation to future climates. And finally, I will, uh, the last approach is actually something that is not done yet in trees, but we, will, uh, we are working in that direction that is actually a combination of the, the full triangle between genotype, phenotype, fitness, and environment. And then we have, uh, I, I brought two, two studies here for you to see. One is in, again, in my campaign where we were trying to select a number of conservation uh, of populations to, to select uh, the minimum number of population we should conserve to present the genetic variation. So we use some molecular markers to identify different gene pools that you have in this map in different colors. And this is just the, 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 the gene pools, the, the population that are different because of geographical and historical reasons. And then what we saw is that there were a number within these uh, gene pools that were identified with markers. We saw that there were kind of substantial variation in still in quantitative traits because there were populations that were actually having different level of selection for, for different traits. So at the end, we, we came to identification of conservation units that is combining uh, molecular information, genome information with quantitative genetic information. And I believe that this is the, the way to go, the approach of integrating information from different sources. And this work here is goes a little bit further because what it does is they combine genotype, genotypic and phenotypic information that we did something similar in my campaign with environment. And they use these this correlations and, and this information to, uh, to do something like this. So here you have, this is a map is of, uh, of the intensity oscillation that you can get using this, this um, it's a very sophisticated approach. I'm not going to enter into details. But what it means is like, uh, this is a map of selection intensity. It's telling you which populations are under higher price of selection. And you can see that the natural selection is stronger towards the, the range ages, mostly here in the south of the distribution of the species. That means that there are more selection pressure here, or basically in northern Mediterranean populations, and then also a little bit in the north, but less. And then uh, having this, this um, the good thing of these kind of models is that then they can use the, the future climatic data to see how this selection intensity will change. And what it says here is that what is going to happen in the future? In principle, actually, uh, the populations in southern Europe, they are already under very strong selection. So, so it's not going to happen anything to be for them. But then uh, they, they are going to, uh, well, it's going to be uh, more or 
it's going to get harder in other in other parts of the range. It's going to get harder in Central Europe. It's going to get harder in in, in Romania. Actually, you can see here that well, uh, this is for Arabidopsis, but probably will will happen for other plant species as well. So so they they think that they the intensity oscillation is migrating north at the same time that uh, climate is getting hotter and drier also in, cent in Central Europe and more northern populations. So, uh, I will uh, finish just so we do some perspectives and some uh, challenges of, 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 of the current state of the situation. And how, like, um, this is a very lively field, so so it's advancing, progressing very fast, but we have still a, a lot of a lot of work to do. So first, the uh, the uh, as we have seen, genomics has a lot of potential to provide a more representative estimates of of evolutionary adaptation, uh, local adaptation, how it takes place, how uh, to estimate genetic parameters, parameters, but still. Uh, we don't know very well how how genome-wide variation uh, is is important for for these estimates and which estimates can provide the most robust prediction. So there is a lot of methodological work to do. Uh, in most conservation situation, uh, we can use genomics to predict traits. We 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 know we can use it to to predict like uh, to compute additive genetic covariance, genetic correlations. Uh, get information about genetic architecture, but that's actually needs work that is based in, in uh, intensive work from both the genomics and the quantitative genetics part, and probably this could be restricted just to a few species. So, so how can we generalize on these few modern forest trees that are more studied, like in our case, is, that could be my pine, panus pinaster, but in your case would be probably oaks, but uh, how, how we move from that to have a general view that works for for all forest trees? Uh, still, uh, we have to 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 identify what is the relationship between gen genetic diversity, fitness, and adaptation of population viability. In principle, we say that genetic diversity is good for for survival of populations, but actually. Uh, that needs is a very just a very general statement that has to be explored deeper. Uh, we need to categorize the spatial scale of local adaptation. What is more important, the, the adaptation at the small geographical scales or large geographical scales. Uh, there is a promising field uh, that uh, we are working on that in, in different European projects that is connected genomics and transcriptomics or the omics with uh, remote sensing and ecological modeling in order to to, to predict uh, future adaptation because actually, the, as I said in my presentation, most of this work is aiming to to try to, to do something, apply something useful for forests to adapt to, to future climates, mostly. Uh, genomic data alone may not be enough because there is also epigenetics, there is also phenotypic plasticity, uh, it's not clear how much or what type of genetic variation is more important for, for the future. So, so it's not clear how much of that or, or which kind of genetic variation should be preserved. And then also something that is of great interest now that we have genomic data, that we have all kind of, of, of data, markers, and information. It would be very useful to have, uh, uh, it would be very useful to, to have different sets, a set of genetic markers that can be used for different uh, uses. For instance, it would be good to have markers that could uh, allow us to, to identify the origin of a plantation, for instance, uh, like just using genetic methods or to estimate population structure or to do traceability of particular interesting provenances in, in greenhouses. And finally, uh, I guess my, this is my, my last slide, and to finish my, my presentation, I, I would like to, to bring these measures that actually we, in academics, we do a lot of, we have our own dynamics that basically we are moved by publications and evaluations, we need to, to get funding, and we have our academic discussion, but this, this circle has to, to participate, uh, it has to connect better with the real world conservation uses. 
And here we are still uh, trying to, to get, because it's, it's normally it's difficult to get from academia to, to policy and management. And, uh, and I want to bring my, this message to, to you that this is a very important thing. Whatever we do in, a, in academia need to be translated to the, to the forest services. It need to be translated to, to the policy makers because that the, the ones that will have the capacity to apply this information in the real forest to, to do the, the real work that is so much needed. And that's all, just to, with that, uh, I want to finish. So here you have some of my, uh, uh, where are you? Here, yeah. Okay, so. So here you have some of my main collaborators in this slide. Just for, uh, just for you to know that this is the work of many people coming from, from basically many, many places of the world, in particular in Europe. And I have here also my contact information if you at some point want to make any questions or, or to enter into any kind of, of collaboration with us. And that's all. Thank you so much for, for your attention. And I think we have now time for, for a few questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gonzalez Martinez, for your very interesting presentation. Now we are starting the short session for questions. If there are uh, any more questions, I see a question addressed in writing in the public chat by our colleague, Professor Nitsa. If there are any questions, please uh, write them down on the public chat, or you could start your microphone and even your camera if you want to, and address your um, uh, questions to the uh, to the speaker, to Dr. Gonzalez Martinez. So first of all, if you want to answer the question of our colleague Nitsa, which is written yeah. in the public uh, chat, you see the yeah, I see the yeah, it's true. Like uh, that's the. Actually, in case you cannot see it, I will uh, read his question. As far yeah. as I understood, there is a need of more phenotypic data. Is remote sensing and terrestrial laser, laser scanning a solution? Uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. It's, a, it's actually a very good solution. And uh, actually, we, it's, an, uh, it's something we, 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 it's going to be, there's a new European project that will be starting in January uh, called For Genius, and one of the main thing we will do in this project will be actually to use remote sensing and, uh, and uh, drones and this kind of or a manner aerial vehicles to, to try to produce uh, to get uh, to get more phenotypic data and, and normally we will need to sacrifice a little bit of the, the accuracy the precision to get a, a larger data set but but that's the, the way to go because what we need to do is to produce information at a very large scale basically to work at the scale of the full distribution of regional species and there is really not a, 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 a good way to do that with, without having this kind of, of approach where we can produce massive uh, amounts of data. Yeah. All right, thank you very much for your answer. Are there any other questions? I see another question from uh, Professor Oliver Galing. Okay, yeah, the question is, could you comment on the possibility of high throughput phenotyping of seedlings for association studies? Uh, yeah, that, that's a good option, actually, but the, the issue um, I have, I've done a lot of association studies, as, as you know, and, and actually uh, the, the question is, uh, is worrying me uh, lately, is like, uh, uh, what is, the, uh, first we are, we are working with seedlings, so, so for some trace, there is a very strong correlation between uh, uh, trace in juvenile style and other trees, but for all there is not. So, so what we do with trace that are just more, that are not correlated. Uh, and, and then also it's about the testing environment, because our, uh, they, they, they start to be more and more studies that uh, they are telling us that what happens in a greenhouse is not the same thing as it happens in real life. Uh, there are very important factors like competition, mycorrhiza, etc. That that they are uh, they are uh, present in, in in nature, but they are not present in, in actually in uh, in the in the greenhouses in the same in the same way. So 
So, so it's, it's, it's an ocean, it's a way to, to, to progress, but still uh, it could be useful to have methods to do uh, large phenotyping in natural population directly. All right, thank you very much for uh, this answer also, and uh, we'll have to, st to stop this uh, question session. If there are any other questions, I'm sure that uh, Dr. Gonzalez Martinez could answer you if you are going to email those uh, questions. So we are now uh, going to um, the next uh, presentation. We'll start again the presentation of uh, uh, Professor uh, Heinrich Spieker. He's uh, the one you saw in the program. I was starting to present him, but I think there's no need for presentation for Professor Heinrich Spieker. He's one of the well-known foresters, not only in Europe, but around the world. Uh, he's the chair of forest growth and dendroecology at the uh, Freiburg University. Uh, he also has uh, uh, fellowships and uh, honorary uh, degrees from uh, universities all around the world, going from Brazil in Curitiba to, let's say, the United States in Wisconsin University and uh, Canada in Toronto. And coming back to Europe, he uh, he's also, um, he was invited professor in different universities. I will only mention uh, Boku in Vienna and also our Transylvania University. And certainly uh, to, let's say, uh, go around the world, we could also mention the collaboration with the uh, University of Hubei in China and so on. But as regards uh, Professor Speaker, as I was telling you before, I always remember him from a summer school many years ago when I was having the chance not only to hear him speaking about valuable trees and their management, the management of this good quality timber stands in the classroom, but also in the forests around Freiburg. So uh, that's uh, for me a very great pleasure to hear again, uh, Professor Speaker. And I do hope that in the future, foresters will speak about this and they will be uh, listen, speaking about valuable uh, timber and we do hope that this valuable timber will go into, will be processed in Venire and not going in containers to, to China. Okay, so uh, I will start the presentation of uh, Professor uh, Speaker. Inviting me to this uh, symposium on forest and sustainable development, I will talk about management of available oaks. Well, this topic sounds rather traditional, but uh, I would like to come back to what Professor Adrian said. Can this system, this management system, be adaptive to today's needs, which are not only valuable wood production, but include many other ecosystem services? So first of all, some information about oaks. Oaks are one of the most common tree species in the world, as you can see on this graph. They, we have different types of oaks, uh, xerophytic oaks, which grow on, in dry regions, uh, mesophytic oaks, which grow more in medium and moist regions, and the hydrophytic oaks that grow in flooded areas. As already mentioned, oaks are spread all over the world from America to Europe and to Asia. In Europe, they are quite widespread, especially in Central Europe, but also in Southern Europe. The most prevailing species in the temperate forest are the Cecil oak and the Bedunculate oak. The Cecil oak covers a relatively smaller area, especially in Central Europe, but going from the uh, Sweden down to Greece. The uh, Quercus robur, the Petunculate oak, has a little bit of wider range, going more to the east and going more to the north. And then we have uh, another important uh, oak species, the turkey oak, which is more growing in the Mediterranean area. What are the common properties of those oaks? General characteristics, oak can live a long lifespan. Oak have a high root biomass, which gives the oak some competitive advantages. They can sprout from roots or from stumps. 
and uh, they can yeah they can also re uh, generate from seeds of course and these acorns are rather big and provide the young plants with nutrients what is the ecology of oaks most oak species are light demanding they are because of their root system resistant against storms they are quite drought tolerant they are sensitive to late frost and some of the oaks are also flood resistant and many different insects feed on oaks and acorn also serve on for as food for animals so coming back to oaks and their long life spans this means ecological advantages the oaks cover covers the soil for a long time. We have continuous nutrient cycling, low interventions, and economic advantages. Because of the low interventions, the costs are low. And oaks of big dimension provide valuable timber. However, there's also, of course, an economic disadvantages. Growing oaks in long terms, terms means long-term investment why are oaks valuable as i already mentioned they not only produce valuable timber they provide many ecosystem services they contribute to biodiversity soil protection forage and so on and oaks have also a high cultural value oaks are adapted as well to a wide range of sites Coming back to the cultural value, already in history, oaks played an important role. Here on this painting, you see a person throwing a stick to an oak tree in order to get down the acorns and to feed the pigs. On these coins, you see a woman planting an oak. This coin was developed just after the Second World War and the meaning behind it was to give hope that in the future the country will grow in the long run. And there is also a, uh, uh, leaves of oaks on many other coins. Because of these different values, oaks have often been promoted by people. And these ecosystems of oak serve many purposes at the same time. But how should we now manage these oak forests? One important aspect is also the economic aspect, and that is the value of the wood. And the value depends on the quality. For veneer wood, we can get even more than 3,000 euros per cubic meter. For barrel wood, the prices are somewhat lower, but still high. And for saw timber, even for saw timber, the prices are higher than for uh, conifers, for instance, in the same region. Only industrial wood and firewood is of rather low price. So the quality makes the difference. The price also depends on the dimension. The larger the diameter, the higher the price. And the higher the quality, starting with a very low quality D, that is the price for uh, firewood, uh, they go up for veneer and partly veneer up to, in average, almost 500 euros. So, what makes the difference of the quality? There are outside visible damages uh, especially branches which are not wanted. The quality is depends especially on the branchiness and the stem dimension. But there are other aspects like the stem form, mechanical damages, wood color. This yellow light color is very much wanted. Also the wood structure is of some relevance. The wood should be rather smooth and others. So this is how a valuable log of oak looks like. Large dimension, no branches, uh, smooth structure of the wood. And that are the trees that we want. We had guests from China 
they looked to that big old oak tree and they said, oh, that is what we need in China as well. And then they asked me, how long does it take to grow such a tree? And I said, 300 years. And then they were not anymore very sure whether this is really what they want. The oak is used for high quality for the veneer, but the barrel wood is also, as I already mentioned, high priced and we can produce a beautiful oak packet and flooring. So now for management, what is the question? How can we stimulate diameter growth? The diameter growth is closely related to the size of the crown. So we have in even extend an almost linear relation between the diameter breast height and the crown width. And also here, when we give the tree more space, the crown can grow faster and right away the increment is increasing. So by giving the crown more space, we can accelerate diameter growth. On this slide you can also see the relation between crown width and diameter growth. The red circles describe the growth in diameter in equal time steps and the green color means the size of the crown projected. And you can see that the big crowns produce wider rings and that means the tree grow much faster in diameter. So we need thinning in order to accelerate diameter growth. Here is an example of an unthinned sand. We can see some differentiation. The small size trees die after some time because they get suppressed and the larger trees grow somewhat faster. So we have some kind of self-differentiation. And now when we thin such a stand, the diameter grows over time, is accelerated, as you can see in these green curves, while in the red curves we see an unseen stand. So by thinning, we really can accelerate growth. However, when we give the tree more space, the ground base gets lower. On this slide you see the green color means the height of the trees of the same age and uh, the blue color means the crown base which on the big trees it's much lower. That means the clear wood part of the stem is much smaller, shorter than if we uh, put the tree under more competition. So how can we stimulate the pruning in order to control the branchiness? We can stimulate natural pruning by giving the tree rather little space and let them grow rather dense. Then the uh, lower branches die fast and we get a fast natural pruning. We can also do artificial pruning. As you can see here, we have even developed special techniques on how to prune, but actually, unfortunately I have not the time to explain this in detail here. But you can see the result. On the left hand side you see a pruned tree, artificially pruned tree, and in the same stand an unpruned oak. And you easily can see the difference. So now we have a problem. We want to have large dimension, but no branches. And this is not possible. So we have to find a compromise. On the one hand, we have to emphasize diameter growth. And on the other hand, we want to emphasize pruning. So the compromise is that we develop, uh, that we divide the development in two phases. The first phase, where we have a fast height growth, we have the pruning, and in the second phase, we stimulate the diameter growth and leave, give the tree more space. That looks finally like this, that at the beginning, in the first 40, 50 years, we stimulate pruning and later we allow the crown to develop and the crown base stays rather constant. So traditionally, uh, the crown base moves slowly upwards during the time. And that means that 
inside the tree, we have this branchy core, which gets bigger and bigger, the higher we get at the stem. And that means the lower part is valuable, but the higher part is not really very valuable because of the branches. In order to avoid this, we stimulate the pruning in the first phase for some more time by natural pruning or artificial pruning. And then we get this core inside, which is in green color, which is in the upper part much smaller than before. And that means, as a consequence, that the diameter growth is not as in natural conditions, growing fast up and then slowing down. Then it is slowed down at the beginning because of the pruning, but later because we release the tree more and more, the ground gets more space, and we get a continuous growth of the diameter. So traditional, it looks like this, and now with a new system, the ground base stays constant, but the question is, where should we have the ground base? Some people say the crown base should be at one third of the total height of the tree. But we did some analysis and we measured many trees with different growth and we looked to the ground base and for instance, if we have a radial growth of two millimeters, the diameter of 60 centimeter can be reached with a crown base at 50% of the total height. So 50% of the total height would be what we need in order to uh, produce a tree with 60 centimeters of and 2 millimeter radial increment. But now which pr trees produce actually the valuable wood? It's a limited number of trees and those trees we call the future crop trees. This is an example of a future crop tree, which has a nice shape, clear bowl, and has a potential to grow for a long time. Now the question is, what should be the distance between those future crop trees? This distance would be too small, because the crowns are too close to each other, and the lower branches will die even at a later stage, and we don't want to see these kind of dead branches which uh, reduce the quality and don't contribute to growth because they don't produce any assimilates. This would be the right distance. The lower branches would stay alive. And the distance can be calculated in a very simple formula, which was a result of a quite a long study we have to multiply the diameter at breast height by 20, and then we have the distance between the trees. So an example, if we have a tree of 70 centimeters, and we want to have an annual growth of two millimeters, uh, a radial growth, then we would have 14 meter distance between the future crop trees in average. Or that means also we can have in total 80 oaks per hectare. And that is how the crop trees are released, before and after release. Again, before and after. So we may ask the question, how many competitors do we need to cut, let's say, in a 10-year period? And this number of crop trees at the beginning is very high. We have to cut in 10 years almost five trees per hectare. And later, when the trees get thicker, we cut less and less at the end, even in 20 years, only one tree. And this is rather independent on how fast the trees grow. For instance, here we have 1.5 millimeter radial increment or two millimeters or three millimeters, but the course look rather similar. So to conclude, we need at the beginning to cut more competitors and later we cut less per unit of time. And finally, at what age should we harvest the crop trees? And for this, it is interesting to see how much is the contribution of the crop trees to the total growth of the trees, of the whole stand. And at the age of 40 years, the volume increment of the crop trees 
is only 8%. But at the age of 100 years, this percentage increased already to 50%. And that means the older the trees get, the more of the total growth is contributed to the valuable oaks. And that means, of course, that we should have long rotation age in order to produce a huge amount of valuable wood. And now the question comes, can this kind of management support multiple purposes of oak forest? So I come back to the introduction of Professor Abrudan, who said, our system has to adapt to the needs of the people. And now the question is, can this kind of management support the needs of the people? My answer is yes. When we think about the provisioning services, as we have heard, of course, oak management produce valuable timber, veneer timber, saw timber, but also fuel timber. When it comes to regulating services, can oak management contribute to climate regulation, mitigation of climate change? Yes, it can. Because these long-living oaks can store and sequestrate carbon, and because of the high quality of the wood, also the carbon is stored in the later products made out of the wood. Other regulating services like flood regulation, water purification, are also uh, provided because of the long longevity of the oaks. Then the cultural services, the people that recreate in the forest, they like the aesthetic values of these big oaks, and there are also spiritual values which are served by this kind of management. And that is especially the case because of the special architecture of the big old oak trees. Then the supporting services. Oaks are, have a rather high adaptive capacity. And we have heard the word adapt adaptive capacity quite a few times already adaptation to changing climate condition because they are rather drought resistant, resistant against storms and resistant against floods. And they contribute to nutrient cycling and soil formation because of their longevity. And they also contribute to biodiversity and habitats because the light oak crowns allow light to penetrate. And so in these oak stands, there is a high structural diversity and the acorns and leaves provide food for all kinds of insects and animals. And how about the economic outcome? Well, the cost for establishing and tending young oak stands can be quite high. But on the other hand, we have the good quality, which means high prices. However, we have long lasting production times, and that means that the economic outcomes is very sensitive to the asked interest rate. So, for managing valuable oaks, for multipurposes, we have really the potential that oak forests can provide these values. So I would like to finish now my presentation and uh, because the time is over and I would like to thank you for your attention and if you have any questions I'm pleased to try to answer those questions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much Professor Speaker for your very interesting presentation. I'm sure that all uh, viewers gathered information very useful for their future practical activity and not only also for maybe their um, scientific uh, research. Uh, let's see if there are any questions written uh, on the public chat. And I'm also asking if there is someone who wants to turn on your, his, his mic or her mic, microphone and uh, ask a question live it's also possible. I think I will have to take the screen from you. Yeah. Well, it seems everything was quite clear, so 
No questions needed. <laughs> well, let's, let's see. Uh, no, 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 there's uh, no question any uh, for the moment. But I will ask you a question. Uh, I'm very interested to hear about the situation in Germany as regards the public opinion, as regards to foresters, because you uh, see in Romania we are facing a quite strange situation. Foresters and especially silviculturists are regarded as the enemies of the forest. And public opinion is um, uh, stressing on ideas like stop cutting any small branch from the stands, thinking that this is good sustainable management for the forest. I'm curious about the situation, the situation in Germany. Germany, okay. which has a longer tradition in forestry, and maybe the public is with a different perception there. This is a really interesting question, and since I'm uh, uh, already quite long in this business, I can say when I studied forestry, foresters were very highly estimated. They were one of the most prestigious professions, and uh, people even asked the foresters whom to vote for. But this has totally changed. Now we are in a similar situation as in Romania. Most people believe the best management is keeping the foresters out of the forest and let the nature do it. And have more and more protected areas. But the problem is most of our forests are artificial forests. They are man-made forests for uh, managed for certain purposes and to leave them now without any management is not really uh, providing what uh, some of those people hope that we get uh, after a short time a wilderness with uh, natural diversity and so and of course we also need in the future more uh, renewable resources uh, and, and everybody would agree yes we need more natural resources and renewable resources but when it comes to forest don't touch them protect them and keep the foresters out. So, in other words, exactly the same situation as in Romania. Right, thank, thank you for your answer, because you see in Romania the situation is even more dramatic. There are old growth forests which were managed in long rotation, and there are people saying those forests are virgin. So it's very important to make the distinction between a real virgin, a really virgin forest, and a forest managed with long rotation as it was uh, customary in Romania in the last um, uh, century. Well, this, is, this is the yes. same with us. I, I showed you the picture of the 300 year old oak and it was managed for, for this long time for wood production. And now, especially this tree which I showed you is now protected. Oh, I see, I see. All right, thank you very much. I'm, ho I'm waiting for other questions. If there are any other questions from the audience, the virtual audience. Okay, because we're trying to uh, respect the scheduling. Uh, I'm thanking you again for your very interesting presentation. I do hope to have the chance to see you again in the forest around Brasov uh, this time uh, as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Well, I, 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 as you know, I like this beautiful city of Brasov and I also look forward to come back again. All right, looking forward to for this too. Thank you very much. Now we are going to our uh, next uh, presenter. Uh, which is uh, Professor uh, Davide Petanella from Padua, from the University of uh, Padova. He is also a worldwide well-known uh, scientist and scholar uh, with very important contributions in forest economics. That's very important. We could talk about good quality forests, but if there are no money coming from this uh, forest, it will be difficult to manage the forest in the future. That's why I consider the following presentation offered us by Professor Patanella is very interesting because it's dealing with the evaluation of the services. And much more than this, it brings into focus the cultural services, where the maybe evaluation is even more difficult than for other services. Thank you very much uh, for your presence online, uh, Professor Patanella, and I will uh, give you the presenter uh, privileges immediately. Sorry for a short delay because I have to... Okay. So you, you know this list is changing much more quickly than the climate, <laughs> I would say. 
Can you hear me anyway? Now you will see a big blue yeah. button, a uh, small big blue, a uh, small uh, blue button on the uh, right hand side. Sure. And it's you have okay. to share the screen. The screen is again yours in time. I will make make it full screen. Is it okay? Yes, it's okay. Can you see the? Yes, we can. The we can see it. Page of my presentation. I'm only turning. Okay. My, my camera and my mic. Okay, so I can start. Thanks yes, please lot. go on. Thanks a lot uh, to Transylvania University of Brasov. Uh, it's a uh, rector and very good friend of mine, all the colleagues. Uh, I'm really honored to uh, give this uh, presentation on a rather new topic from a point of view of uh, forest economics. That is the role uh, of uh, forest-based cultural services. And uh, I'm planning to organize my presentation in uh, three parts, plus uh, some uh, uh, short remarks at the end. I will start uh, considering the problem of how do we define and classify cultural services, uh, which is their economic role in uh, the total provision of ecosystem service by, by the forest, and uh, why are we uh, considering them? Uh, what is new with them in terms of uh, forest policy, forest governance, um, related uh, political aspects? So let's start uh, with the topic of definition. Uh, I think everybody uh, among the, the people uh, here knows uh, the uh, very classical uh, uh, classification of ecosystem services proposed by the Millennium uh, Ecosystem Assessment. Uh, three plus one uh, categories, and uh, the three main categories are the provisioning services that uh, in the forest uh, economy means uh, wood, non-wood forest products and water. The regulating services, uh, among them uh, carbon sequestration, biodiversity protection, water cycle regulation, disease regulation, and finally the so-called cultural services. And uh, for the cultural services, uh, uh, there are problems for uh, classifying them. And uh, the most advanced uh, uh, effort for uh, 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 defining a common system of classification uh, is not that one of the uh, Millennium uh, Ecosystem Assessment, uh, but that one uh, by the European Environmental Agency called the CICES, uh, the Common International Classification of Ecosystem Services. Now we have available version 5.1. Um, classification, of course, are very important uh, because uh, uh, thanks to classification, we, we can uh, compare data, we can uh, uh, assess a single uh, ecosystem service uh, from an economic point of view, we can uh, see the development of prices, uh, of demand and supply. So you understand how important is to have a common typology. Uh, of uh, uh, this type of services. And the CICES uh, has made uh, a classification uh, based, based on five levels, uh, the section, division, group, class, and the class type. And uh, here, uh, in the last version of CICES uh, typologies, uh, we see the 12 different uh, typologies of uh, uh, cultural uh, services, what uh, in the terminology of churches are called classes. Uh, I, we don't need to go through all uh, these uh, uh, classes. Uh, you, you see here in bold character the main elements uh, for defining each classes. Uh, active, immersive interaction, passive or, or observational interaction, scientific investigation, education and training, and so on. 
So my opinion that is that uh, this classification that has been uh, developed uh, for uh, taking into consideration all environmental services coming out of, from all ecosystem, and not only from forest, but also from farmland, wetland, and so on, is not so adapted, so suited for uh, catching, uh, for promoting, uh, for describing the variety and richness of European forest-related cultural services. It's not so much useful. We can discuss about that, but that is my impression as a user of this classification. And so I would like to uh, make a proposal of a different uh, uh, classification, starting from even the definition of the group of services that we are considering. Because I think that uh, calling this uh, type of services as cultural uh, is using, uh, it means using a too narrow approach. I think that uh, we should call them uh, uh, more comprehensively as socio-cultural services. And uh, these are for me the main category. The cultural services, uh, sensu stricto, like the, the art museum uh, in forest area, concert in the forest, uh, theater, performance, in, and so on. So you, you see here uh, some example. This artesella is uh, the most uh, important uh, forest uh, art museum we have in, in Italy, in Northeast uh, and in Trentino. Uh, 300,000 visitors, paying visitors per year. Uh, since uh, the 80s, uh, we are organizing all around the Alpine areas, but all, now many other parts uh, uh, of my country, forest concerts that are very common in many other European countries. Uh, there are uh, experience uh, of training, uh, but also of uh, theater performance uh, in many uh, forests all around uh, Europe. A second category, extremely important, is uh, that one of educational and pedagogic services. The kindergarten and uh, all the outdoor nursery service uh, uh, the nature trails, the bird watching, uh, training uh, in the forest, uh, and so on. Uh, you know that uh, uh, the nursery, the uh, uh, kindergarten, uh, uh, nursery uh, school uh, have been developed in Northern Europe, starting for, from uh, uh, Denmark. They are now extremely developed uh, all around the central and north of Europe. And uh, uh, I was surprised because uh, we never heard about uh, this type of uh, uh, nursery uh, for in Italy uh, till uh, seven, eight years ago. Now we have uh, 60 uh, forest kindergarten where all the pedagogic activity uh, all around along the year is run in the forest. And uh, a good indicator uh, of the development of interest in this activity is connected with the presence of international network, uh, national and international network, like uh, this one that I'm showing in the slide. Then uh, we have uh, the very diversified, very uh, developing uh, uh, group of services that are connected with sport activity hunting, hiking, nordic walking, mountain biking, orienting, and so on. And here, uh, really, uh, the uh, semi-structured activities in the, in the forest, I mean, uh, uh, using the forest with a few managerial uh, uh, intervention uh, uh, is uh, very, very common and spread all around Europe. We have the spiritual and religious uh, services, uh, uh, like the place uh, for meditation and worship, uh, and the new uh, trendy uh, use of the forest uh, as a funeral forest or for ecological bu burial. Mm. That is a, a massive, uh, uh, important uh, 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 new services uh, that uh, 
uh, has been experienced uh, already in the States and uh, the last decades, but there was uh, much developing also in Europe, starting from Germany, Switzerland, and other countries. And uh, it, it is really a, a good business if you think to the willingness to pay uh, by the relatives in this type of, uh, let's say, final solution. And uh, I was surprised that in Italy, where we still have a quite strong limitation for developing this uh, these uh, services, uh, we have created a burial forest uh, for the pets, uh, for dogs uh, and uh, cats. <clears throat> and uh, to give you an idea of the level of uh, development uh, of the demand and supply of this type of services, I, uh, I make a reference uh, to this uh, uh, publication that is a manual for finding and managing a Greece cemetery. In US. Then uh, we have uh, the very large and traditional uh, system uh, of uh, services connected with tourism and recreation. So, soft tourism like walking, uh, wild forest products, picking, camping, use of three hotels, uh, a, a new, very trendy uh, fashion uh, activity for many uh, rural uh, tourists. Uh, uh, farms uh, and uh, other uh, tourist related uh, uh, enterprises, uh, the tree houses. Uh, getting to the end of this uh, quite long uh, list, uh, we have the services for social inclusion. Uh, these are the, those activities uh, for the elderly people, uh, for handicapped, for prisoners, uh, for refugees and displaced persons that uh, are asked to, to work in the forest, that are trained to work in the forest, uh, also as a, a way for improving the, the social inclusion. We are, in this case, uh, sometimes using the term social forest, uh, social forest uh, activity. Uh, they're quite uh, important because it's extremely diversified and very effective. And finally, we have the service for improving uh, wellness uh, and for therapeutic treatments. Uh, again, uh, nothing uh, very new uh, in the world, a long experience uh, in Japan uh, and in Korea, then uh, US, and now a lot of attention also in Europe, connected with uh, what we call forest bathing or shinryoku, forest therapy, specialized forest therapy, pet therapy, also in forest areas, and so on. Um, these two last groups of uh, uh, services are so called that is becoming quite common, uh, a, a, a new terminology. We are speaking about forest care or green care, and that is uh, a sign, an indicator of the growing attention given by many operators uh, to these uh, new ro roles of the forest. Again, some information, especially to the international uh, uh, organization networks uh, that are working also in Europe uh, in this uh, sector. And uh, um, I would like uh, to mention the very good work done uh, by the Austrian Research Center for Forest Program in this sector. Uh, since uh, uh, the, the previous uh, uh, rural uh, development planning period, they are supporting with RDP funds investment and activity, starting from training to real uh, concrete uh, uh, in, uh, opening of uh, activities related to the uh, so-called forest care sector. And uh, I would like to, to mention also that uh, last year we started working also in cooperation with uh, Transylvania branch of University, a Erasmus Plus project called Green for C, in which uh, we are working on this uh, four uh, sector, what we call the forest-based care, urban green care, social agriculture, green care tourism, with the aim of improving entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial capacity uh, for uh, 
the offer of these services uh, in different uh, environmental uh, uh, contexts, but uh, with a focus uh, uh, to the forest area. So, how much are they worth, all this activity? Hmm? While there are no many data, uh, we may uh, refer to a very well-known uh, estimate done at the world level of the value of ecosystem services by the Ru uh, Rudolf de Groot and his group. Uh, here, uh, I, I don't want to, to look uh, at the single data, but uh, I, I would like to focus on the, the relationship among the different uh, figures related to different uh, group of services. Here you see a summary table, hmm? a summary table for different ecosystem. Hmm? And here we have also uh, the temperate forest. And uh, look at the value of the provisioning services at the value of the regulating services here in, the, in this paper, they they make a distinction between regulating services and habitat services. Uh, so we should uh, consider them in an aggregate way and to cultural services. And finally, uh, look at the uh, statistical uh, role of these uh, cultural services on the total value of the services, one third. One third, but if you look at the uh, cultural services that have been considered, the list is quite short. Huh? They forgot to consider some of the services that I just mentioned. And practically only one service that is a recreation is considered. So a very redu reductive approach. Hmm? Uh, unfortunately, uh, no relevant information are available. I'm sorry, here the, the slide was moving. Uh, are available in FISE. Uh, you know, FISE is uh, the forest information system for Europe. And it's interesting, if you go to the topics uh, uh, of uh, information that our European Union-wide forest uh, uh, information system is providing, you don't see any reference uh, to cultural services. And uh, uh, the same situation is related to the famous uh, uh, report, the State of a Europe Forest, uh, developed by Forest Europe. Uh, um, we have now, in few months, uh, we will have available the 2020 uh, edition of, of this uh, uh, report. And the report is making reference to the very well-known uh, set of six uh, criteria for sustainable uh, use of the forest, uh, where in the sixth, uh, we could find uh, uh, the so-called uh, uh, socio-economic uh, services. Well, I can tell you as one of the uh, authors uh, of this part of the report uh, that the information available um, is very poor. Uh, so, sometimes we make a reference to other publications. There has been a recent publication by Mario Toralba and others uh, on uh, the relevance of cultural ecosystem services in forest management in Europe. No many data about the value, but, but the data about motivation and uh, interconnection of cultural services uh, with other services. Uh, from the information provided uh, in this uh, paper, I take uh, this uh, uh, this figure because I think it's interesting. Uh, they have made a European-wide uh, survey and they asked, among the other questions, could the site area that you manage deliver any more of these activities if you receive additional incentives? Well, uh, here, uh, the, uh, the, the outcome uh, uh, of, of this uh, uh, survey that for me is quite interesting is that uh, in providing this type of service, there is no much dependence from public subsidies. Take in mind this point because we'll get back. So, um, to conclude uh, on, on this topic of the value of the service, keep in mind that, in fact, uh, the few available data that we have uh, have uh, at least uh, three sources of under-evaluation of the total value that are presented. Well, first of all, we have seen that uh, some 
very important and dynamic component of the set of the services are not assessed at all. Then uh, it's interesting to note uh, that uh, in all our classification, while the forest products are in included in the category of uh, uh, the provision service. Well, I think this is a mistake, at least in the advanced economy in, in Europe. M many people are picking uh, uh, mushroom berries, uh, not because uh, they need uh, for their nutrition, but it's uh, a recreational service, so a social cultural service. And then uh, uh, um, there is a narrow vision in uh, uh, evaluating uh, uh, the economic value of these services, not consider the downstream impacts uh, of this economic activity. In relation uh, to the second cause of uh, uh, under-evaluation, uh, you know that uh, picking of wild forest products uh, has been uh, in Europe analyzed by a, a project that is called the Star Tree, and we found out that 24%, one-fourth of the European families, households, are going normally uh, in a forest uh, for picking some wild forest products. I think that is an important social uh, and uh, economic message. Uh, picking uh, uh, these products is the first uh, social activity in the, uh, by the Europeans in relation to the use of their forest uh, resources. And which uh, uh, products are mainly picked uh, wild berries, mushroom, and forest nuts. And this is only for a very small amount of people, a business area. And business areas are mainly connected with truffles, sap, resin, cork. But most of the other peoples are collecting uh, these products as a culture and social and tourist experience. About the third cause of uh, under-evaluation, uh, the fact that we are not evaluating the real economic impact is very well known by all people that are working in the field of uh, forest therapy, where the quality adjusted life years indicators is used. And if you look at the literature, it's quite rich, the literature in this field, you find that uh, for forest activities, uh, this indicator is uh, 50% of uh, means uh, that uh, uh, the, the efficiency uh, of the forest uh, in treating uh, uh, people with diseases, special diseases, uh, is a very, very high. We have a 50% of the cost of uh, alternative ordinary treatments. And another example uh, of the uh, downstream activity and their importance is connected with the mycotourism, much developed, uh, starting to be much developed uh, in Spain, but also in Italy. We have uh, mountain communities that are depending on the mushroom economy, like the quite famous uh, uh, Parma uh, uh, Porcino, the fungo of Valditaro, uh, here you see all the activity that are focused on this uh, uh, single uh, uh, type of mushroom. And of course, it's not important itself, the commercial value of the mushroom that makes uh, uh, this uh, local economy alive, but are all the related activity that you see here. Uh, they have also a, a, a mark of traditional origin. So. What is new uh, with this product? Hmm? Uh, the new activities uh, that I mentioned uh, are able to meet uh, the needs of emerging citizens that, are, that the welfare state is often unable to satisfy. Uh, they, are created, uh, they are creating uh, new demands for new expertise, so no new job opportunities. Uh, and they activate new financial sources from outside the forest, especially connected with SRI, social responsible investments. And in some way, they are bringing new fresh area in the forest sector. And the private social sector 
is normally far ahead of the traditional forest sector and they are leaders and the way of thinking uh, introducing new business model new activities uh, new form of marketing for these services and i would like to give you a simplified view of the european uh, um, ecosystem service economy we have the three categories which are the main reference institutions or drivers well for the provisioning service the market for the regulating state the regulating service the state for the cultural state the the, the community uh, the social uh, uh, environment uh, uh, and uh, it's a very important economic role and uh, which are the instruments and the theory the economic theory behind the development of these uh, three groups uh, of services the prevailing uh, instruments uh, for provisioning are prices under market economy economy uh, through the neoclassical economics uh, thinking under the regulating services we are the instruments of compensation incentives in few cases of payment of environmental services this is a field of work and thinking of rental economics and the state regulated market economics behind the social cultural services we have uh, many cases in the non-profit sector and the social economics and here there is a de definition of social economy that you could uh, uh, read uh, after my presentation and uh, which are uh, the, uh, the impacts of these uh, new developments uh, uh, looking uh, uh, at these impacts uh, from a, a internal inner perspective of the forest sector well there is a gender revolution uh, the men are not any any anymore the the the, uh, the driver the the subject of, of this uh, economic activity and uh, i would like uh, uh, to remind you uh, the introduction of a very famous uh, textbook uh, uh, thousand thousand of forests are studied on this uh, book in, in us uh, where uh, fernov the author of the book uh, was writing the first and foremost uh, purpose of a forest grow is to supply us uh, with the wood material it is a substance of the tree itself not their fruits their beauty their shade their shelter that constitute the primary objective so a timber center uh, approach uh, to forest education and i think people uh, new people are laughing about uh, this very old minded approach another uh, impact is a change of funding involving the forest sector in the healthcare and the educational system is opening uh, this sector to external financing uh, here you see the public spending for one day hospital treatment in Europe that as you can see is quite low in Romania I was very surprised looking at this data but is almost reaching 300 euros per day per person and I want to tell you what a forest owner Italian forest owner was telling me when he was contacted by a hospital uh, for people with mental diseases and they ask him uh, can uh, we bring uh, 30 people here for one day uh, in the forest and he said yes okay they will need assistance or, the, or they may do them damage no problem of assistance for the damages to the forest uh, we will compensate you oh uh, how much are you going to give me oh we are uh, open to give you 50 euros oh that's good and he didn't understood that uh, that was uh, 50 euros per person per day he was gaining more money from that day in which he was offering his forest for this service uh, than uh, for almost an entire uh, rotation period of, uh, for pro timber production and uh, a third the last uh, change is a cultural change in the covid 19 area how we are now measuring human progress, how we improve the quality of life, uh, how we are abandoning or not a, a consumptive 
consumptive model in our economy. I think that uh, this type of developments are useful because they stimulate our re rethinking of the contents of a bioeconomy. Maybe we could say that we need more forest-based uh, social cultural services and less uh, bioraffinery. Hmm. And here is a quotation that help to uh, think to these uh, topics. So concluding with a couple of remarks, which are the two, at, at least two lessons that I would like we bring home. The first one is that in the relation with the external world, we uh, as forest uh, need to encourage governments and large institution to recognize and respond to these new opportunities. Uh, think to the contents of the recovery and resilience plans that we are preparing in these days. Uh, and the forest sector can play a new, important, relevant role. And the second message is uh, in connection with our forest educational system. I think that we need to adapt our vision of the forest and the contents of our teaching, trying to consider with a bit more attention some social sciences and work uh, with the interdisciplinary approach. Are we adequately taking care of forest care issues? This is uh, the last uh, question and I want uh, to conclude uh, my presentation with this a uh, bit uh, rhetoric uh, question for uh, opening the discussion. Thanks a lot for your attention. All right, thank you very much, Professor Patanala. It was a very interesting presentation, uh, and uh, I think that we could uh, shorten our virtual coffee break uh, in order to answer to some questions. Is it possible for you to see the questions? There are three questions written down in the panel, uh, yeah. the public chat panel. If you could answer, we would be grateful. Yes, sir. Uh, well, uh, a question about FSC uh, to a person that uh, till one week ago was uh, for six years the chairman of FSC Italy. And Italy has been the first country in the world that has been introducing uh, uh, the new system for FSC uh, certification of environmental services. So my answer is uh, by sure positive. And I can tell you uh, that uh, we are now testing and working uh, uh, in Italy for defining a new standards uh, for FSC certification in connection uh, with the cultural services that at the moment are not included in the FSC standard. Okay, thank you very much. And if you could answer another okay, question, maybe question. Uh, any information for Southeast Europe is just a map for Italy. Well, um, to say the truth, I was making reference to many examples uh, uh, in my country, in Italy. But uh, uh, the leading countries in developing this type of services are the center in Central Europe and in Scandinavian Europe. Uh, I could find uh, easily many other examples uh, uh, from these countries. Of course, uh, probably uh, uh, some East European countries are, are coming a bit late uh, to the development also for the social condition in the last uh, uh, months. But um, I, I, I think that um, uh, they, they could take advantage of the experience uh, that we are gaining in other parts of Europe uh, and uh, adapting very rapidly to this new development, as we have done in Italy uh, uh, for uh, the uh, forest school uh, that have seen, uh, as I mentioned, a very rapid uh, recent uh, development. In the concept of giving, we are heading to a trade-off between forest ecosystem services. In your opinion, how much of the ocean? What is the we have in the future? And fast? Well, um, I don't think that we need to, uh, to go towards a segregative approach. Um, I much support uh, Professor Speaker's approach uh, based on multifunctional use of forest. I think there is much synergy to be gained uh, between uh, uh, long-term management of forest for high-quality timber 
production and this and many of these uh, cultural services. Maybe I, I stop here and I try to respond in written yes. form. Maybe it's a, a good uh, choice. Thank you very much. And uh, indeed, we are all agreeing about uh, this. Multi-purpose forestry is the best uh, option because it's important to evaluate the services, but it's important to look at where the money are coming from. And at the end of the day, having the timber, which is a valuable resource in the forest, a owner could be sure that something is coming as, a, as an income for him, because otherwise the financial schemes could be, let's say, less uh, stable. Thank you very much again, and uh, it was a very interesting presentation. Let's have the coffee break. Enjoy your coffee. Not a virtual coffee, but uh, the break is virtual. The coffee, I would uh, say, could be as good as you can uh, afford. <laughs> All right, enjoy your coffee, please. And we'll be back at 12 o'clock. Sono le ore 11. Oh, all right, sorry. So let's resume our let's resume our uh, plenary session. And uh, the next uh, speaker will be Professor Hans Heinemann, who will uh, talk about a very interesting issue for any foresters, I think, now, about this new paradigm of forest ecosystem uh, management, which is replacing the classical, let's say, silvicultural uh, approach. Professor Heinemann is also a very well-known uh, scientist uh, with contributions in uh, the forest ecology uh, domain. And uh, for not uh, having any delays, I will ask him to start the presentation already loaded. And I will ask everybody else to turn off the mics because uh, there are some, uh, there is some microphone. All right, thank you. And uh, please, uh, Professor Heinemann, this, the floor is yours. Yeah, okay. Thanks a lot for this nice introduction. It's a pleasure to me to share some thoughts. Uh, as already mentioned, it's somewhat a paradigm shift. And if uh, you have a paradigm shift, this always goes along with the question. Is this just the old wine in new bottles, or what is the essence of this new thing? And let me start with a preliminary remark. Uh, it's, it comes from Einstein, who said, the significant problems we face cannot solved at, be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. So we have to take a different perspective. I think this happened exactly around the 1990s. It started in the US. Uh, it was politically driven, this ecosystem management uh, approach that uh, many th uh, of you may have heard. I have three key messages for my presentation that I will go to explore. I think we have to integrate always, if we talk about ecosystem management, three types of knowledge. Uh, it's about uh, target knowledge, system knowledge, and transformation knowledge. Very often we talk about system knowledge only, and I think that's not enough, and I will explain you a little bit uh, what that means. The second thing, and this stems mainly from complexity science, the world is made mainly about interdependencies and not the behavior of a single entity. It's complexity complexity stems on interdependencies. There's only complexity and you can only explain complexity if you look at interdependencies. Every scientific discipline somewhat started and, uh, by looking only at uh, the behavior of single entities, but now with complexity science we are starting to look at interdependencies and I will show some things about that. The third message is forget about the planning foresters have been doing because we cannot predict the future. We cannot predict complex systems show behavior like regime shifts and we cannot predict them. So we have to take a totally different uh, perspective which is more uh, an adjust and controls perspective. 
Let me now introduce my framework of the three knowledge domains. So the system knowledge where we have to uh, understand structures and functions. This is the, the what we have been doing all the time, but now the new thing about it is interdependencies. The network science is uh, a part of complexity science is uh, part of it. By the way, those who are interested, read the book linked from uh, Parabashi. Uh, it's written for the general public. It's very interesting and very eye-opening to understand a little bit what this means. And the target knowledge. It's interesting that we talk a lot about future uh, uh, sustainable development, but nobody really can tell you how this should look like. There are myriads of ideas how this could look like, but no one has a clear idea what this is. And I think this will probably be impossible to define it. And finally, the key issue is how to get from here to there. It's about uh, transformation knowledge. Now, the target knowledge has been uh, originally mainly defined by foresters, but in the meantime, it's a lot of interest groups worldwide that start to influence what the target knowledge should be. The stakeholders is one of the key issues uh, that uh, always comes up. I would also call it interest group liberalism. It's a term for political science. If we go to transformation knowledge, uh, we have to, uh, to identify mechanism of collective actions. How to uh, that are effective, and it's, it's not only let's say about the discussion and debate, but really bringing things forward. Then, of course, efficiency both in the classical domain and in the ecological domain. You have may have heard the term eco efficiency to make more out of less. That's a, a, another challenge in the future, and uh, you can see that uh, just now we have to manage risks. But it's not only about risk. Risk, they, we know about the risk. It's ambiguity. And for example, with climate change, that's much more ambiguity than risk. So there is a phenomenon that the people perceive, but there's no interpretation that is generally accepted what it means. And this is exactly what we'll see more in the future. And going to control engineering and adaptation is more feedback-based uh, management approach in the future. What are the thrusts of change along those three axes? Uh, in classical forestry domain, we have to move from stand development to a cross-scale in the dependencies. I will come uh, sh show that later. The scale we are looking looking at the reality is very, very small uh, scale, and this is not enough. We have broadened this to broaden the scale, the landscape scale, and I will try to show that. Then, classically, we have been talking about a triad of forest services. It's wood supply, protection, and welfare. Uh, welfare came only about 1965 as a third ingredient to this triad, and this had been the, the classical tool that you have heard in forest politics and uh, forest economics. And now we are talking about ecosystem services. What does this mean? In the third things, these mechanistic regimes, I think the, the regulatory schemes from the 19th century, how to manage forests, there's still somewhat around, but they don't really work. So we have to go to more a self-organized organized adaptive management approach. Let me now come to the changing requirements. This has been the uh, traditional uh, triad. Environmental movement uh, resulted in something like that. Service debate somewhat covered what was there before. And if you listen to discussion, it's only about services. And we forgot a little bit about wood supply. My question is often to environmentalists, where should the paper come from? Paper consumption increases by orders of magnitude. How to do about that and what to do about that? And usually I don't get an answer. Target knowledge. Uh, was mainly, uh, I think, shaped uh, by ecologists. And here is one of the 
I think, path-breaking articles uh, that appeared around 2006 in Trends in Ecology and Evolution from Carpenter and Folke. And they uh, coined two terms. It's about adaptive uh, governance and about adaptive management, whatever that means, at least they give uh, uh, a definition. However, if we look at the reality, some people say we should go for multifunctional, stakeholder-driven, sustainable forest management. I'm not, at least for me, it's not so clear what that is. Others, they say, no, it's more close to nature management regimes. And if you listen to uh, people who do uh, spatial optimization, they will tell you optimal solutions should lie on the Pareto frontier. So how to cope with that? Let me now move to the concept of e ecosystem services. Services as goods is an economic concept. I have to emphasize this is not an ecological concept. Services is a, an economic concept. And uh, I saw in one of the previous presentations, people are using that. There was, for example, uh, somebody mentioned five ecosystem services. I think that's far too narrow. So what we have to develop is a more comprehensive framework what ecosystem services are. And uh, I usually explain it like that. First category is biochemical cycles enabling and supporting life. They are called life support services. Then a second category is the supply of commodities and energy carriers. It's called provisioning services. Third one is provision of quality of life, quality of life services. Then you have safeguarding and passing on the cultural heritage, cultural heritage services. And the fifth category is uh, provision of aesthetic and spiritual values as aesthetic spiritual services. Those are the five categories. Of course, within each of those categories, we have a set of services. And just to uh, explain later a little bit how that is. Coming back, Classical forestry has been about those green services. You see how we have to broaden our perspective and how to balance it, so that's a challenge. If you look at life support services, uh, the, the decisive services are carbon cycling, water cycling, nutrient cycling, photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is one of the driving processes that enables life, enables and supports life, as is respiration. The other way around, and then it's more about gene, gene flow than biodiversity. Biodiversity is a really result of gene flow. It's not a, an entity per, per se. Let me now move to system knowledge and uh, let me go to the spatial temporal interdependencies. On the x-axis you see the spatial, uh, the spatial scale and on the time, uh, the uh, y-axis the time scale, both in logarithmic scale. So if you see several entities that we are looking at, you can see it's from biochemical processes uh, that are on a very low spatial scale. And what is important, the lower the spatial scale, the lower the time scale. It goes along. Large, large scale systems, their response time is much longer. So the landscape catchment is much longer. If you go to these disturbance processes, storms, fire, and insect calamities, somewhat like that. And if we include what we are doing uh, from an operational point of view, this uh, somewhat fits in like that. Now the issue is the following. Silviculture, if you look at silvicultural textbooks, it's mainly about this window that we uh, look at the reality. And this might be a little bit too narrow. And I think uh, the uh, ecosystem perspective has to widen this perspective to go for a window that's four orders of, on logarithmic scale means a factor of 10,000 in spatial and temporal scales to widen. If you look like that, of course, you have a whole bunch of things that you see 
it's from the needle to the landscape. And it's also the calamities and the damage regimes and the disturbance regimes that have to be uh, uh, considered. And that's one major claim of uh, ecosystem management. We have to make disturbance regime part of our management thinking and of our management approaches. When I did my studies uh, a long time ago, disturbance was something that we didn't tolerate. It was something that didn't fit in, but it's there all the time if you look in, in history. And of course, uh, you can put this window a little bit in a, in a different place, but I think uh, the main message is that you have to widen, to, to, to widen this window. I will now show you uh, one thing on the landscape scale. It's system knowledge. It's exactly the interaction between storm uh, disruptions and the behavior on a landscape level. If you look what storm Lothar did, I have data from the Lothar storm in, in Switzerland. What is the patterns of gaps that the storm created on a landscape level? If we put that on a cl classical uh, histogram on the left, we see this distribution. And distribution is 50% quantile is 1.5 hectares and uh, the 95% quantile is uh, 4.5 uh, point something hectare. So this distribution is a heavy tail distribution. We don't see much in, in this. Uh, in complexity science, people are looking a little bit with a different uh, perspective on that. If we uh, plot a density function, and we have the size in logarithmic scale on the x-axis and the exceedance probability on the y-axis. So the exceedance probability density function, we get something like that. And what does this mean? You see uh, 10 to the power of minus 1. It's the second part from top. If you go to the right, you uh, end up with about 3 hectares. This means if a storm like Lothar occurs in a certain landscape, the probability uh, of 10%, you have uh, uh, damage sizes uh, of, the, the, pop, uh, of uh, the patches larger than three hectares. If you go to a probability of 100, one in 100, 1%, it's about 10 hectares. This is what it says. Now, the interesting thing is, this comes from complexity science. Complex systems show in the tail very often the so-called power law. It's perfectly power law distributed, what we found here. I didn't find it, that in the literature. You see, here's the, here's the parameters of this power law distribution. Barabashi, uh, I mentioned before, the network scientist, found out by the end of the 1990s there are two extremes if you look at interdependencies. It's a, a lattice type where every node in a network has exactly the same number of neighbors. And then you have a, a random type where the number of neighbors is uh, distributed according to some uh, random distribution. But most real world systems that are stable, they follow a power law distribution. So uh, you will also fi find this in uh, Barabashi spoke about link. So I think this could be uh, an outcome that you can use to design your civil cultural regimes. For me, it doesn't make any sense to limit the uh, maximum patch size for clear cutting, because what nature does is a pattern of different patches and different sizes. And I think that is where we have to go in the future to simulate somewhat, uh, some type of, of uh, such a distribution if we do regeneration of forests. Then at the stand uh, level, uh, we follow usually this uh, risk management philosophy. You have first an agent uh, that causes some strain, that acts on some asset, and then you have a critical effect. And usually we try to understand the relationship between those and the response, between strain and effect. 
Oh, this is uh, from ecotoxicology, where you usually have a curve like that. It's this S-shaped curve. And uh, the vulnerability uh, can be quantified. It's a conditional probab probability of a system reaching a prescribed limit state. That's uh, the issue. So we, we just started to look at that. For example, the interaction between uh, wind gust strengths and the behavior of the response of of uh, of, uh, of stamps and i think that's very important if you want to go into the future here's another example uh, the data i had from ted hawk in uh, canada about drought strain uh, and i think to manage really all those challenges that are coming up we have to understand those interdependencies between strain and effect a whole range of strain and effect. Let me now come to transformation knowledge. Uh, and this mainly stems from complex adaptive system. Here is another, uh, I think, uh, seminal book that was written from uh, John Holland, a complexity scientist, Adaptation in Natural and Artificial Systems. I think the, the key message is we cannot predict complex adaptive systems impossible because they show regime shifts. So what does this mean? Number one, we have to go from clockworks to dynamic interactions. And here I think network science will be an ingredient in the future. The second thing is we have uh, to leave, try to be perfect and go to an approach, continual improvement. It's adaptation. We don't exactly know how it will be in 20, 30, 40 years, but we just try to adapt all the time a little. And then uh, we, most of the decisions, not only in the forestry domain, are made on the assumption that we have certain knowledge. Of course, we don't. Knowledge is uncertain or even ambiguous. And uh, I think we have to look at that. And number four is, the cultural prescription might in the future more be recombinations, mutations, and uh, structures. So it's a deliberative experiments. What is a control engineering perspective uh, for civil culture? You have the system under control, it's uh, the stand. Then you have some outcome. Usually we characterize them that the DBH distribution or something like that, there would be other metrics. Then you have some control input. See, the culturalists control the input of radiation energy. That's what you, that's what you change by doing uh, thinning operations, and uh, it affects uh, photosynthesis mainly. Controller is a prescription. Uh, you have prescriptions, and you have see, the culturalists to implement that on the ground. Of course, you have civic cultural regimes that define you how the world should look like. We rarely have feedback loops. So traditional uneven aged management community has been relying on that with the so-called control theory. They do an inventory every 10 years and so and look at the error. You look for the error between what you found and between uh, how it should be. And you control the whole system for the error. So that's a control system perspective. How could an adaptive forest management framework uh, look like? I think uh, what has to be done under an ecosystem management approach, we have to be spatially explicit in, in terms of the output. And we have to feed back that, that to the controller. We have to also to add system state variables, road stress and so on, water stress, there are others, and to feed that also back. And if you have a system like that, it's a, a temperature control system in a, in a room. You cannot control the temperature in a room by assuming an average annual temperature. You have to feel what the temperature is and to control it. That's the main uh, thing about it. Technology will be a main driver. The interesting thing I show you, the I3 Police Spectre magazine in August 
and on, on the front page, how artificial intelligence revolutionized forestry. It's not a forestry journal. AEEE is the Institute of Electric and Electronical Engineers. That's interesting that things uh, turn up there. And I, th I think one uh, ingredient is unmanned airborne laser scanning systems. Of course, a lot of software. For example, we are able to create tree maps, not only stand maps, but tree maps. You see here a tree map, what, which was created uh, out of laser scanning, and there was some data fusion to create that. I think uh, that's what we can do nowadays, and we have to take advantage of it. Let me try to sum up. We have to integrate three types of knowledge. We have the target knowledge, the system knowledge, and the transformation knowledge. Target knowledge is about ecosystem services, and there, definitely, we have to have a comprehensive concept of what that is. As long as you cannot define it, that's uh, that's an outcome from economics. If you're not able to that define a service, you cannot manage it. In the dependencies instead of the behavior of single ent entities, the, the disturbance landscape interactions, we have to improve our knowledge, we have to understand the strain stress behavior at the stand level. We have to forget mechanistic planning and use a gradually adjusting control perspective. Just keep in mind the temperature control in the room based on the prescription, how it should be, and uh, assuming an average annual temperature and then go to manage it. Then uh, you will be too cold for many days and too hot for another couple of days. This means uh, we have to have a follow a control engineering mindset and the outcome uh, and system state feedback. By the way, the whole thing that I mentioned here requires that we have to adjust also our educational framework. We have to introduce new courses to introduce all those new concepts and we cannot rely on, uh, let's say, the very traditional subject areas that we always were looking at. And it will be about sensors, 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 and a lot of data anal analytics. People are talking a lot about big data. For me, it's not the size of the data. This doesn't matter. It's more about how to fuse different data sources. And the trend there is we see more and more unstructured data that we have to, uh, to fuse with tra traditional structured data. This is a big challenge to have the corresponding analytics. What I wanted to share. Now I'm happy to uh, answer questions. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Heinemann, for this very interesting uh, presentation. I'm saying always this, but I mean it all the times. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we'll have some questions. Let's see if there are any on the public chat written down. We are waiting for those questions in the public chat. Uh, till then, I would ask you a uh, uh, question. I totally agree with your uh, opinions expressed in this presentation, but do you think it is necessary to, let's say, replace the term silviculture with forest management? Sometimes we do this. For instance, in our MSc course, it is named like this, forest ecosystems management. But uh, as regards uh, my opinion, I think we have to be also traditional a little bit as regards the, let's say, the name of the uh, disciplines, and uh, certainly silviculture, as any other science, is evolving in time. It's changing the content at the end of the day. But I think we should stick on the traditional name of uh, this uh, science and practical domain, silviculture. That's a personal opinion. I am I'm asking you about your comment on this. Well, the, from the inside view, that's may be appropriate. From an outside view, maybe you should think about adapting some also of the terminology. A lot of the terminology that we use, I give you some uh, examples from my field, uh, forest engineering operations. Some of the terminology, like forest utilization, 
stems from 18th century French, the first textbooks. And in the meantime, it doesn't make sense anymore because neighboring disciplines do no longer understand what we are doing. So I would suggest to go to umbrella disciplines and study how they are looking at it and try to somewhat find a compromise because it's important in a social discussion that other disciplines understand foresters. For example, with forest management in Germany, it's Forst Einrichtung. The president of my university always thought Einrichtung means uh, to, to arrange things. So it's about uh, seeds out in the forest and things like that. Nobody understands it. So we have to think about the outside world. Yeah, that's, that's right. I completely agree with you. There's a short question uh, on the panel, if you can see it. Our colleague, Professor Dedsen, is asking if sensors are not a public, or sensors is not a public monitoring, to write the question exactly, to read the question, sorry. Sensors? No, I sensors, I will give you just, sensors are so cheap nowadays. Yeah, that's right. I think we will be able one day to sense diameter growth of single trees, to sense height growth of single trees, to uh, sense carbon cycling, things like that. And I think to use, to make use of sensors, or I found in Japan one guy who developed sensors, they can mimic the behavior of bark beetles, so you can sense the bark beetle and things like that. I think this will be the future, that's exactly what the IEEE publication uh, in, uh, of uh, August this year, it's, it's, it's this whole range of sensors and diffuse all the data to have a much better picture to be able to understand what's going on in real time. All right, thank you. And then it's a very short question in the end. I want to ask you, because you've mentioned the complexity of science, and I'm totally in accordance with uh, your statement that complex systems are very hard to predict, even impossible, but because they have regimes and so on. But what could you think about, what do you think about uh, the atmosphere and climate? Because it seems that this statement is not applying to climate. In my opinion, atmosphere is one of the most complex systems on Earth. And <laughs> in my opinion, there's here uh, an issue between the, let's say, the statements in complexity science and the, let's say, Current, perce current perception, not only in media, but also in some parts of the scientific community. Yes, I agree. I totally agree that uh, atmosphere is an extremely complex system. And I know from my colleagues in atmospheric sciences, most of the models they use, the, the response they you get is heavily depends on the boundary conditions. So it's I think you should be aware that maybe we don't understand everything and there might be much more uncertainty, which does not mean to take precautionary methods, not to push the system into a state that you don't it want it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay, thank you again for a very interesting presentation. And uh, we do hope to see you in Brasov as soon as possible uh, and earlier than two years from now at the next session, next International Symposium. Thank you very much, Professor Heinemann. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will go on with the following uh, presenter. Uh, I will ask uh, Dr. Manakos if he's here. Let me see. So the next presenter will be Dr. Uh, Ioannis Manakos. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. I'm you just, cannot uh, see me, I don't know why. Yes, I, I'm trying. You cannot hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. I can okay, that, that, that's see okay. myself, that. unfortunately, I don't know why. It's connecting to the webcam. Okay, so um, uh, I will give you presenter uh, privileges and you will... Uh, share your screen you will receive the blue button on the bottom side so i will um, introduce the next uh, speaker is um, dr yanis uh, manakos from um, the center for research and technology hellas in greece uh, actually 
Uh, his team is uh, really a pan-European uh, one, with uh, members uh, from uh, certainly Greece, but also from uh, Belgium, uh, UK, uh, as you will uh, uh, see on the other slides. Uh, certainly, it looks like appropriate when speaking about remote sensing because satellites gives us uh, an integrative uh, perspective. So it's, uh, let's say, uh, to be expected to have such a wide uh, uh, team with uh, researchers spread it all over uh, Europe. So, uh, uh, can you see my screen? No, not yet. Uh, it says that it's sharing already here. Why? What's happening? It seems it was loaded, but on our screen it's the introductive uh, slide. Yeah, the first one, yeah? Is it? This is uh, yours? Copernicus Assisted Services for Forest Monitoring. No, 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 no. You, we cannot see this slide. I will check. Mostly for a reason. No, no, you, you have, uh, you have uh, presenter rights. Have you pressed no. the button to share, to share the screen? You have to share yes. the screen. Yes, I press the button, but I don't know what's happening. Because I have a totally blank screen now. So, Press again, maybe the button. If you could press again the button, or I will, uh, I will do like this. I will uh, take you. My problem is that I, I, I don't have any indication. Let me, let oh, me. All right. all right. So I, I will uh, take please the presenting privilege from you, and I will then repeat the operation. Maybe second times is luckier. Now you should uh, have the button again on your screen and you please press me? it. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, but uh, I can't see your slide on the... Uh, now it's loading. Ah, great. That's good. Okay, that's that's okay now. Uh, so, I don't know why I cannot share my face. <laughs> I am pressing <laughs> the button, but it doesn't seem to be You working. have to start your camera. Uh, anyway... Uh, doesn't uh, matter, we can continue. You will see uh, Dr. Uh, Manakos is an enthusiast uh, presenter. That's why I have to tell him I will uh, stick my eyes on the watch, because with him as a presenter, it's very difficult to uh, have uh, the time schedule in, uh, in front of your, uh, uh, of your eyes. Uh, it's, it's easier also for the, let's say, for the, for the audience to, feel the, to, to lose the time, uh, uh, the time uh, pace. All right, so uh, the screen is now yours. And uh, we are Thank looking you. forward can, to can you. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we can see your screen. I, I will uh, enlarge it on the whole. Uh, yeah, OK. So now you are on the whole screen. OK, good. So uh, thank you very much uh, from the colleagues and friends at the University of Transylvania. We started our uh, joint journey last year, and I'm very glad for this. And I'm very honored to be invited here and talk to you. I am very thankful for the previous presenters and the information shared. And I wish to contribute my two cents to that. So you see here that uh, I am not alone. We are a big group of people cooperating for many years together. And I wish to honor each one of them from, from whom I have taken any small piece of information to present you what I have in mind to present. So I would like to thank uh, Helena, Isabel, Sergio, Kusik, Hande, Alireza, Argirios, Marco, Anastasios, Christos, Danai, and Georgos for this presentation. So, uh, we are, uh, I'm going to speak to you about Copernicus Assisted Services for Forest Management. And uh, we are facing challenges. Challenges are related with uh, services to sustain it could be protection of flood, it could be tourism, it could be aesthetic result, it could be educational, as we saw, as we have seen before, it could be biodiversity. And at the same time, we have also pressures to mitigate uh, due to climate change condition, uh, uh, different uh, pesticides, uh, air warming, beetle attack, wind throws, uh, depositions of uh, material and other kinds of changes that might happen. So in order to do that, uh, we need uh, geospatial information and knowledge on, uh, knowledge on the spot of what is happening as frequent as possible. To that end, uh, we have uh, our, uh, the big privilege 
uh, to be assisted uh, by Earth observation data, which with time are becoming uh, freely available. And with time, uh, this uh, generates uh, new methods to be shared through open source codes, uh, through repositories, and so on. So the material, the information, the data is there. It's a matter of uh, our knowledge and our capacity to combine all this information to meaningful results for uh, forestry and forest management. So why Earth observation? This is coming from the Copernicus Market Report. We can use Earth observation for resources mapping, for resources monitoring. So we have applications that are related to uh, Earth observation assimilation possibilities. So for the inventory of forest resources, monitoring changes in resources over time, evaluating land productivity for forest types given biophysical and climatic factors, timber harvesting, silviculture, fire management, prediction of fuel wood and other resource supplies, with the benefits to have an improved monitoring technique to provide the basis, quantitative basis for risk assessment, to identify potential areas of intervention, so we have a wide coverage of the whole area, land use and post-fire erosion monitoring, prevent deforestation, demand assessment for wood-related products and resources, vegetation health management. And this is to support all kinds of sectors, from forest managers to NGOs to governmental institutions to timber managers to forest fire sector, private sector, public, and so on. So, in a nutshell, what can we gain from Copernicus? So, from Copernicus, we gain information on a repetitive way. So, every X days, information is there. Uh, this is in high quality because uh, it is <coughs> systematized, in the system, it's given in a systematic way. And the long-term delivery of this information is also guaranteed by the Copernicus program. So the forestry sector, among others, makes already use of such services. I can mention, for example, the European Forest Fire Information System. So what we are trying to do with Earth Observation Remote Sensing is to generate remote se remotely sensed proxies from the reflection of the, uh, of the canopy or the structure of the forest in order to approximate and estimate the real physicochemical canopy values. So this should be done, to my understanding, with minimum human interference and competence in a systematized way. For example, nowadays, we are in the position to tap in to the thesaurus of satellite data that the Copernicus Open Access Cup is providing us, and with a single commands to retrieve information in a repetitive way and speak about results that can be shared on the fly with our colleagues and in formats that also can be shared and utilized by decision, different decision support systems. So not only that, uh, big data is accumulating and uh, this is uh, being taken care of from the information technologies. So for example, there are the open data cubes. And the open data cubes can generate cubes of data like these ones. So from Sentinel-2 data, from Landsat data, from optical data, or whatever data you would require that are coming with a raster format, then, uh, the, uh, then these are uh, put on top of the other, and then we can generate, uh, let's say, 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers tiles with uh, X uh, sequences of time, with uh, the numerous bands that are provided, so we can synthesize a multi-cube of information and these cubes of information would be delivered to us and uh, we can just drag here an area that we are interested in and directly the system on the fly can produce the synthesis of each pixel of productive vegetation, non-productive vegetation and bare soil and give us a chromatic uh, a color calendar, color legend for us to define what is there. So the idea is to ease the way of access. So to not to demand special skills to operate that, not to demand any pre-processing, and if possible, to have processes on the fly in real, in near real time or real time if possible. So out of all these uh, assessments and processes and so on, uh, the European Union has managed to generate products uh, from uh, space from satellites, which are targeting fires, pest control, and so on which are giving services about the burnt area uh, or indices that are approximating the physicochemical features of uh, the canopy in question. And this 
can be provided in different spatial resolutions of 300 meters, one kilometer, and so on, and they, with a very good temporal resolution, so that we can have the pulsing of the Earth's surface, the pulsing of the forest through time. So these are available products to download in a high temporal frequency. We have also products that are available in a low temporal frequency, like the Copernicus Land Monitoring Service, the high resolution layer of forests, which can be divided in three types of products. So three cover density, dominant leaf type, or forest type product. Or we have also the Corinland cover, which generates products every three or more years, uh, where uh, forests are delineated across Europe, across specific countries. So this, let's go a little bit deeper in the high resolution forests. Uh, layers, and uh, these are pre-covered density with, with a range of 0 to 100% and 20 meters spatial resolution. We can know, we know for the Earth's surface which is the dominant leaf type, broad leaf or coniferous, and pre-covered density range for the forest type. You can see here that uh, we have a monotemporal, monotemporal coverage or a multi-temporal coverage. This means that depending on the framework conditions of the production of the specific coverages, we can have avail we can have products that are of low temporal frequency repetition to be delivered to us. We can also have we can also have tailor-made products which are on-demand products. For example, let's say that uh, I am a protected area manager and I wish to know where to install uh, pathways for pedestrians for tourists to come and enjoy the nature. So I can generate map through the use of digital elevation model, digital surface model, land cover for the area, earth observation supported vegetation indices, and with codes that we have developed to identify areas where the visual disturbance is zero or the visual disturbance is 100%. So this way, the park manager may know where to install the pathways so a visitor can enjoy forest without uh, his or her eye vision may be, be disturbed from human artifacts. So these are tailor-made or, or examples or tailor-made or on-demand products. Now we have also, in addition to the products, uh, available online platforms like the Forestry Thematic Exploitation Platform of ESA, which enables commercial, research and public sector users in the forestry sector efficiently access satellite data-based processing services and tools for generating value-added forest information products. The platform offers also pre-processed optical and radar data from the Sentinel satellites of the EU Copernicus program, as well as data from other instruments. Ancillary data and third-party data are also made available. You can also find there GIS software or other image analysis software that can be used through the platform. Available services also use Earth observation data, like the European Forest Fire Information System, which aims at improved forest fire prevention in the European and the Mediterranean regions, especially there where most forest fires occur. Now, the EFIS network is comprised of contributors that are uh, within these 40 countries that you see here in the list and it's coordinated by the Joint Research Center and the DG environment of the EU. It, uh, the modules that are available are related with the fire danger forecast, active fire detection, rapid damage assessment. The fire uh, weather index is mapped in six classes, very low, low, medium, high, very high and extreme. The information on active fires is normally updated six times daily based on MODIS uh, VIIRS images. And the rapid damage assessment model analyzes modest daily images at 250 spatial resolution to map burnt areas, depending also on the severity of the burning. We have also forest service policy frameworks that are supported uh, by earth observation data, like uh, the platform and the effort uh, to reduce emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. And they can be used in the different uh, phases designed for this reason, by different systems and levels, and the aim is reducing the emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, conservation of forest carbon stocks, and sustainable man management. So the idea is to develop a worldwide forest monitoring, monitoring system in order to uh, speak about greenhouse gas emissions and removals from deforestation, 
deforestation and degradation activities in forest land. Having said that, we have moved from the NAD about the products, through the platforms, through the services. And on top of that, the EU is also generating uh, financial frameworks for consortia to build with a contribution of different actors, like the private sector, the public sector, uh, forest enterprises, and uh, uh, also uh, forest ma management authorities, and so on. So these consortia uh, submit proposals in order to gain grants and generate products. And uh, the services that they are producing give us a sense of what can be done with Earth Observation and what are the needs. For example, there is a project, it's called My Sustainable Forest, which is led by the GNV in Spain. It aims at integrating Earth Observation significantly further into the forest realm by demonstrating the advantage of incorporating Earth Observation-based information into the daily decision-making protocols and operations of the different stakeholders across the silvicultural chain. So the service portfolio is about forest site characterization, wood characterization, volume, biomass, and CO2 stocking, forest condition, ecosystem vulnerabilities, forestry accounting. Another project is also ongoing, led by GAF in Germany, and this aims to bring Earth Observation Services for monitoring dynamic forest disturbances to the users. It aims to offer operational Earth Observation-based tropical forest monitoring services to support countries and the wide range of users with accurate, relevant forest information data for their management and reporting requirements. So they speak about biomass and biomass change map, generating forest disturbance and degradation maps, forest non-forest maps and change maps. So you see that a lot is being done and uh, companies are also interested because it's a strategy, uh, it's a strategic goal to become a, a member in the sector that provides such, such services from the FISA rules that Copernicus products and services uh, are uh, offering uh, without a price in a free, on a free basis policy. Together with uh, Demos and other colleagues, uh, we formed a consortium, CERF, my institution, and we have submitted Nextland project. And this is a project uh, uh, which is an innovation action. So this means that we aim to bring Earth observation uh, products and services within the decision support chain uh, of the forestry, of the silviculture sector. And we, in order to do so, we aim we have generated user scenarios. We are in close cooperation with the users, asking them what are the requirements and how do they envisage to see the, product, the, the, the services at the end. So we adjust the services and we customize to the needs of the users. And then we are aiming to growth and sustainability and we are communicating our results and network. But what are the services about and what are these user scenarios? So we have user scenarios that are related with agriculture in this project and user scenarios that are related with the forestry sector. <coughs> so for the user scenarios that are related for the forestry sector, we aim at tackling deforestation in legal logging issues, forest growth, fire impact and risk assessment, and forest health. <coughs> in order to do so, we are supported by services that are developed by Deimos and Vito, mostly, which speak about services that aim at change detection, forest fire burn scar, forest density and statistics, sorry, <coughs> tree health indices, and forest classification. In order to do so, <coughs> we are supported by the European Forest Institute, companies that are working already in the field and able to contact owners and companies. So, First of all, we define the needs. So we require time series in order to speak about what's happening in matters of deforestation, degradation, and permanent loss of forest cover. In order to speak about illegal lodging, removal of trees without permission, possibly leading to degradation and deforestation. This service requires administrative information <coughs> to cross-check reasons for ground cover biomass changes. So we need to generate clear-cut maps which are able to show illegal logging, deforestation, regrowth status of clear-cut areas. 
The services aim to have a pixel size at the end of 10 meters, to have a weekly coverage through Europe, and to be able to have over 85% accuracy. So what about the user requirements? This is what we are now struggling to find out. The project started in the 1st of July, and we are working on that. Similarly, for a forest growth, we have uh, defined the service need to estimate net annual increment changes of forest growing stock and uh, to design a forest regeneration map. So we need to understand what is the growth status and what are the different uh, tree species and what are the growth ranges of them in the field. To do that, we are, we are, the service has to do with forest classification in the area, again, utilizing Copernicus uh, satellite, supported satellites, and the services are going to be fine-tuned with reference data from users in order to speak about the accuracy at the end and uh, the coverage of their needs. The next service speaks about far impact and risk assessment. You are, are all aware about that. And we need to speak about BEM severity, forest management planning, insurance and compensation. And in order to do that, we have to generate maps that speak about that in a repetitive way, in a systematic way that can produce and that can provide an accuracy that support the credibility of the product for the users. Next service speaks about forest health. So the forest health has to is related with ab abiotic factors and biotic agents currently most damaging, for example, the European spruce bark beetle, fungi, pests, and others. So this means that we have to take into consideration the proxies that we can generate, which are, in our case, from the remote sensing perspective, different kind of indices that are well correlated with the vitality of the canopy. And for these reasons, we need a close cooperation with the users so that we can calibrate these proxies to specific health incidents. And this is an ongoing project uh, process right now. So all in all, we have to speak to the user community. We have to do a needs analysis in order to understand how best this remote sensing people, this remote sensing result can speak to the users in a way that is understandable, that the users can trust and can use in their daily work. To do that, we can define different kinds of users from the ones that are very experienced or capable of producing added value products themselves to the others that have no experience or little experience with tackling with earth observation data. To do so, we have <coughs> identified and we have generated uh, questionnaires and we wish to tailor make our approaches to each user, to each customer at the end. This end, at the same time, we are developing a new platform for earth observation based forest services under development by Deimos, it is called Store for Air, and it has all the uh, facilities and all the amenities that the user might need in order to search for the product, the thematic product that the user would require to look at the product, how it should look like, to receive metadata information about the quality, about the quality of the product, and then decide whether to proceed purchasing the service or the product. Now, this was a kind of overall description of products, services, what is available with examples, how the companies try to get into the sector, I mean the earth observation based companies which are provide, wish to provide added value services to the foresters and the forest managers. Now, we have identified in our work, at least the work with my colleagues here at the Institute, that canopy height is a critical monitoring variable. Uh, which is done, which is uh, connected uh, to uh, biophysical parameters like primary productivity and forest health, and many more. The traditional methods uh, is uh, let's go in the field and measure exactly what is the height, which is great, but uh, this is costly in matters of budget and in matters of time. So we started uh, searching whether we can uh, use satellite and airborne sensors. In, as an alternative method, which can give uh, results which are credible for the use by the forest manager. So to that end, uh, we have uh, developed uh, uh, 
a canopy height estimation approach from single multispectral two-dimensional airborne imagery, not stereo images, only one image, to see whether we can use uh, not only the spectral signal, but also the textural features that are within the uh, satellite imageries or the airborne imageries to retrieve information about canopy height. We have proceeded and developed an approach with a multi-resolution analysis, which ended up to results for the forest, Bavarian forest, uh, of uh, correctly classified uh, objects of 91%, which speaks for a good trend uh, to be useful uh, for the future. Now, uh, different remote sensing methods are used for canopy estimation, height estimation, which is LiDAR, SAR, INSAR, uh, digital photogrammetry, uh, statistical methods, uh, or ad other object-based image analysis methods. All of them have uh, different uh, imminent uh, limitation and face challenges. And so our idea was to generate a cost-effective object, cost object-based approach, which is a classification approach and not a regression approach. Let's see how we have proceeded to that end. First of all, we have identified uh, one of the largest protected uh, forest ecosystem located uh, here at this point in Bavaria. This is the Bavarian forest with altitudes ranging from 600 to 1,500 meters above sea level. And uh, this forest is comprised uh, from three major forest communities, subalpine stands dominated by Norway spruce, mountainous slopes covered by mixture of Norway spruce, silver field, European beets, and sycamore marple, marple, and valley bottoms dominated by Norway spruce, mountain ash, and birches. The study area, was the previous one, and now we have defined the, the height classification scheme. Uh, we have defined it as such uh, because uh, we know that from the land cover, we know where is forest. And to go from the land cover and translate this to a habitat category, uh, we have uh, uh, adapted the general habitat category scheme, which defines six classes. The class names are uh, dwarf hamerophytes, Hamephytes, uh, which are below 5 centimeters in height, stubby hamephytes, below 30 centimeters, low, mid, tall phanerophytes, below 60 centimeters, 2 meters, 5 meters, and forest phanerophytes, which are trees between 5 and 40 meters. So we have labeled these as six categories, and because in the Bavarian forest, these first three categories were not easy to be distinguished from. From, a, from, a, from an altitude, then we have merged them into four categories, into one category. So we, at, we ended up to have four categories at the end. So we have received uh, two orthophoto mosaic, mosaic from urban images of 40 centimeters of uh, spatial resolution and uh, with uh, four spectral bands. And we have worked on these four different areas that you see on screen. And we have retrieved from LiDAR data the uh, digital elevation model, the digital surface model, out of which we have derived the canopy height model. Then we have received the land cover map, the forest habitat type information, and we have uh, summarized the habitats into six main forest habitat types. Then we have received the multispectral airborne photo, uh, ortho imagery. We have segmented according to the land cover vector map. We have masked out non-vegetative uh, land cover classes. And then we have applied texture feature moving windows. We have extinguished the uh, outliers. And then we classified uh, these land cover categories in height classes. And we received the canopy height map at the end. So we have done this uh, in three different phases. I don't want to go more into details now, but uh, I would like to tell you that we have used different texture features in order to do that. We have used 24 different texture features, and we have averaged the values per object of the canopy height, and we have assigned this uh, average uh, derived uh, height for the whole object. So we have used local variance, which provides an indication of the intra-patch heterogeneity, Local entropy as a measure of randomness, which offers an indication of variability and heterogeneity of an object, 
a local entropy ratio which characterizes relative variations within a small area compared with each surrounding one. So the idea is that we took the central picture and we have asked ourselves whether this pixel has a higher value than this, this pixel a higher value than this, and so on. And we have developed a binary code, which we then translated into a decimal code. So we used the local binary patterns, in the same sense the local ternary patterns, or the local ternary pattern ratio, uh, either by using 0 and 1 values, or accepting the fact to use 0, 1 and minus 1, in the case that the central pixel was of higher value than the surrounding one. And we have used also surrounding windows out of this. So we have generated different images, raster files for, it, for the areas, which were able to identify less information potential or more information potential. And then out of this, we have then uh, calculated the texture features. In the fact, uh, we had different kind of data sets in our approach. So we have excluded possibly uh, objects that were missing one features, or we have imputed values to objects that uh, their vector were missing one feature. And then we have removed the outliers, and then we have more normalized all data from zero to one. If you wish, I can tell you more information later on, but the time is pressing, I see. Yes, thank oh. you very much. Yes, uh, then we have used different machine learning algorithms. We have try to work on them and see which fits best. And then we characterized uh, each land cover map uh, object with a vector of texture features. And then we have classified uh, uh, these uh, objects in different height categories. So we have used three phases. One phase was using only airborne data, the other using Sentinel 2 like data, and the other used all together. So we have used, uh, uh, so we have one phase, two phase, three phase. In the third phase, we have used a multi-resolution analysis method. So we have used the best classifiers for the uh, objects which were more coarse, the best classifiers that were the objects which were less coarse, and the other uh, classifiers for objects which were uh, fine, uh, which were too fine. So we have used the best performing algorithms for the objects which were coarser medium course and fine course. And then we have used a tenfold cross facilitation method in order to derive the accuracies. So we ended up having a result for the, all the areas that I have shown, ranging from 64 uh, overall accuracy with a Kappa coefficient of 0 0.5 to 91% uh, of area-based accuracy. I go further and Showing you, these were the first results with the 40 centimeters, giving me an overall accuracy of 60%. By fine tuning, we ended up of almost 70% overall accuracy for the 40 centimeters. When we moved to the 10 meter resolution, we had an increasingly good result of over 90% accuracy, depending on the classifier that we used and the approach. And then we said to ourselves, it could be that if I have different sizes of windows, uh, different sizes of pixels, uh, I might have different results. So we reduced the, uh, the, the, the windows by 50% and we received smaller, uh, smaller accuracies, but still over uh, high overall accuracy, over 85%. This is the result, the final result, where you see that the correctly classified area is 91% of the total area and the misclassified even less. And uh, we have managed to uh, reach um, results uh, with, uh, let me go farther than this. I wish to say that uh, there is a high likelihood that the approach can be scaled up to global coverage. The accuracy is over 85%, and uh, this could be a surrogate thought for LIDAR or other measurements. So the further research steps is to consider multiple areas with different inclinations, to consider dimensionality reduction techniques, to consider other classifiers that we might have not used, and also to use deep convolution neural networks in order to derive per pixel canopy height estimation, not per object. This is an ongoing procedure, this is an ongoing procedure, and this we have achieved new promising results, less than two meter absolute accuracy per pixel with only using Sentinel-2 images, two dimensional ones. Thank you very much for your time, and I'm sorry that I'm 
went a little okay. bit over the time. Thank you very much. It was interesting, and we would like to hear you for hours, but I'm sure that even in two hours from now, your uh, ending would be as difficult as it was now. Thank you very much. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, maybe if you want to give a brief answer, otherwise, uh, if there are some questions on the on the panel. But otherwise, I would ask you to write the answers because our next presenter is uh, waiting, and he's uh, in Oregon. Is three. Is uh, the hour is three in the night for him, and we appreciate his effort. That's why I would say we should be brief in answering the questions and give the floor and the screen to Professor Lyons. All right. Uh, so. The question is, is Copernicus data going to still be free in the near future? So far I understand and I know yes. I have not any other uh, knowledge against that. Can the use of Copernicus data further improve by combining with airborne laser scanning and so on? Uh, the reply is yes, and this is uh, what we are trying uh, to do uh, within the next land project. Uh, also, there is, a, there is a sensor in space right now which gives uh, a LiDAR footprint of 25 meter resolution. And we plan now to check whether the deep learning that we are using can be can assist this LiDAR sensor to generate even better results. Uh, our own present plan Copernicus sensors uh, also in development. What? I cannot understand this. All right. So in this case, I think it's better to answer uh, yes, by writing in the in the public chat yes. for not keeping yes. Project Alliance to wait any longer. I Good, thank you very much. Is uh, very uh, very tired. Uh, Professor Lyons, will I see you can hear me. I will give you the presentation rights uh, in only one minute. I have to find you again. You, oh, you're here, okay. So the next uh, presentation comes from Oregon in the US. It's uh, offered by Professor uh, Kevin Lyons, a Wes Lamata Professor of Forest Engineering at Oregon University. He's going to tell us something about uh, road surfacing aggregates and uh, the shortage issues about such aggregates in Oregon. I could say, joking, just to, let's say, make him more relaxed after this long waiting, that in Romania we do have shortages, we do have issues with shortages for uh, uh, surfacing aggregates even in some cities. Bucharest could be one example in some parts of uh, the capital city. So we are looking forward to hear what could you tell us about this situation in, uh, as regards the forest roads in, uh, in Oregon. The screen is yours. You have to press the button to share your screen. <laughs> can, you, can you see my screen sharing? And not yet, not yet, but... Hmm. Okay. It, will, it, 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 it takes some short time to load, probably. It happens mm -hmm. the same with the previous presentation. In case it won't start, I will uh, repeat the same uh, procedure as before. I will take you the screen and give it back. Maybe the twice, the second time, it work yeah, it will work better. Uh, yes, I will do this. I will do this in this case. Okay, now I'll give you again the screen. Okay, maybe it, sh it should work now. It will work now, I hope so. You know, that's typical in computer practical uh, approach. Repeat the operation, maybe it will work. Ah, it looks like it's something. <laughs> Two times is reasonable, maybe. <laughs> All right. So now the screen is really yours, and I will enlarge it to better see your slides. OK. How does that look? Yeah, it's, it looks uh, very well. OK. All right. So yep, I'll uh, give a little talk on what's going on in Oregon with roads and some of our aggregate shortage. I come from British Columbia. Uh, coastal BC, where it's hard to imagine that there's an aggregate shortage between all the rock from uh, from the different mountain ranges and from glaciation and everything else. But down in Oregon, it's a little different. So we'll go have a look at that. So forest roads, 
Uh, often people will uh, suggest that maybe forest roads should be more like highways or public roads, but they serve a different purpose. Uh, they're out there in the forest, they're used heavily, but for short periods of time. And so we work with them and build them slightly different ways. So a little overview of uh, the current state of forest road, Oregon's uh, forest roads, at least on the coast. And then we'll talk about some solutions uh, for the aggregate shortage. Okay, so the first thing to think about, whoops, first thing uh, with Oregon, when I uh, look at it, is the uh, geology, the underlying geology. And coastal Oregon really is dominated by sedimentary rocks. Uh, the other part of it is the volcanic rocks, which are effusive, so a finer grain that cool on the surface. And they show up uh, more in the Cascades, a little farther east, but on the coast where a lot of the timberlands are, um, the volcanic rocks are in irregular uh, inclusions into the sedimentary area. So finding places to quarry rock is a bit of a challenge in the uh, Oregon coast. When you look at the Oregon coastal range, uh, you see it's really uplift topography, it's rounded uh, ridge tops, deeply incised valley bottoms. Uh, the roads tend to get up on the ridges and stay up there. But really for me, when I look at it, the big difference is uh, from British Columbia is that there just isn't much rock, not exposed. And so the availability for quarries, you're hauling quite a ways to find uh, good rock and find accessible rock. And there's not recent glaciations, there really isn't much in the way of uh, sorted deposits, fluvial deposits that we can use for road surfacing. When you look at the soils in Oregon, uh, these are typical coastal soils, weathered in situ, uh, no granite or no glaciation, but uh, the weathering is uh, forming clay. So typically there'll be you know 10 to 15 percent of clay, as you see in these other slides, uh, that um, really does create a problem for road construction. The subgrade is not strong, uh, goes from very weak to maybe adequate in some cases, uh, but the clay content and the general wet weather, except for the dry periods in the summer, uh, mean that the subgrade is not a, not a very strong uh, surface. And so putting capping or rock deposits on top is important, but expensive. So these soils are, tend to be quite deep. So Oregon is lucky. It does get a, a summer that doesn't have too much rain. So there is a period of time where you can build road, plus a lot of the Oregon coast already has the main roads in. So the road budgets, uh, ro your annual road programs aren't that large. And so those two things together mean that they can get a lot of the work done in the summertime when these clay soils are a little bit more workable. So the goal is to build a very flat uh, subgrade with the clay and then to cap it with uh, crushed rock. So you can see bringing it in, a thin layer of crushed rock over top of uh, the clay subgrade. And so the question becomes, what are you building the road for? Is it just for truck traffic or is it also to manage or to, for your logging equipment? And some of our log equipment is quite large, some of it's tracked. So you have this problem of uh, cutting through the capping if it's not put on thick enough. So again, putting on thicker layers of rock just starts to add into the cost of the whole uh, problem down here. Problem with aggregate now, so we, you can see that we have to cap our roads. There isn't a whole lot of road that you can uh, use without some rock on it. Some parts will be used in the summer, but uh, most of it, if you can use it sort of from fall, winter, spring, you'll have to put a rock surface on it. So where do we get that from? It's from these uh, volcanic deposits that have come up in different places. But we've been at it for a few years here, you know, 100 years or more, a couple hundred years, and it's starting to run out, surprisingly. So rock is one of those commodities which is uh, getting used up. This is a rock pit that's quite near Corvallis, where Oregon State is, and they've gone about as far as their permit will allow them. They can't go any farther. And so that's one of the challenges with, uh, as these pits run out, where are other pits that you can form that have good rock, another rock that's strong enough for roads? 
So there's the problem of the quality of the rock. Uh, can you get to it, access? Uh, you know, you got to get on top of it, open it up. And then environmental regulation. It's getting hard to get permits for new sites. So those three things are coming together, plus our continual use of our existing rock uh, that's creating maybe not a shortage yet, but it will be in the future. Uh, the idea of pits in Oregon. So in British Columbia, we used to smaller ones where you use uh, uh, frequent smaller pits. So you don't bring in crushers and develop a pit for uh, 20, 40 years. But in Oregon, because these uh, rock sources are limited, at least on the coast, uh, they develop these local pits. This is a forest pit and use them for quite a long time. And so you can see that they have to bench down and uh, manage the pit for development. Typically, so they'll bring a crusher in. They don't use the rock as pit run. Pit run meaning just blasting it and then putting in a truck and using it that way. Here they will uh, blast and then crush the rock. And mostly in the, in the forest pits, they'll be using a draw, jaw crusher or maybe a cone and uh, grinding it up into different uh, size distributions. The other challenge then is you don't bring this equipment in for just one day's work. So you have to have enough room to stockpile all the material as well. So there's quite a management process that goes on with uh, developing a rock source in the Oregon coast. Uh, Coffin Butte, that was that one I showed you that was near uh, Corvallis. Some uh, priceless, uh, yeah, it's in uh, imperial tons, not metric tons, but close enough to get an idea. You start putting together the cost per ton for this crushed rock and then looking at the delivery cost when you're talking about hours, uh, dollars per hour, and that you might be hauling 20 kilometers or maybe more, 30 kilometers in some cases, to deliver this rock, you quick, quickly get yourself to a point where you're looking at maybe I'm uh, costing $30 a meter for a road, $30 in uh, rock cost per lineal meter of road that I build. So maybe $30,000 per kilometer. Or if it's a $60,000 road, it could be up to half the road cost comes from the surface material, which is pretty expensive. Uh, compared to what I'm used to. I'm used to maybe a third of that. Uh, so rock is expensive and so we try to use the least amount of rock as possible. But the problem is, and you'll see particularly now with a lot of our equipment, uh, you, our forest equipment, narrow tracks, deep grousers so we can bite into steep slopes. This is becoming particularly common when you start seeing tethered logging. And these machines do come out to the roads. Uh, when you're doing this kind of logging with a tether, you tend not to be using point landings. It's better just to bring the wood down to the roadside. But then all the equipment's working on the road, not just at a landing. And so if you don't have the whole road uh, rocked with a thicker layer, quickly these track machines will cut through it, even if it's not that wet. But certainly when you get a wetter season, running track machines on these uh, thin cap roads over a weak subgrade can be uh, quite a problem. So for logging, uh, minimizing the rocks so that you can make a log truck work doesn't always work for your logging equipment. And even when you look at the, some of the weak subgrades, minimizing the rock for the trucks, so even that limits your access to certain times of the year. So some possible solutions here, moving along. Um, look first at geosynthetics. People always uh, often will jump to the idea of geosynthetics, uh, whether it's a woven material or a grid, when you start looking at fine grain soils and how you're going to increase the strength. So a typical loading pattern for a road might be, you know, Q is the contact stress uh, delivered by the tire. A beta is this idea of a load spread angle. So it's not quite as simple as this in real life, but certainly if you apply a load on the surface, it does spread out to a wider uh, face when it hits the subgrade. The base course, depth D in this figure, effective radius R prime. So contact areas R, R prime is bigger. So we put the load over a bigger surface. The idea being we produce the stress on our subgrade. 
So that's the basic idea of a road with a with a base course or capping on it. Now, how does GeoGrid help or geosynthetics help in this case? There's kind of three mechanisms that you might use GeoGrid for. One's the idea of a tension membrane. A tension membrane's idea is that there's tension, it's a material, and in the plane of the material, it's got tension. So if that material deflects in an arc, there will be a vertical component to that tension. That vertical component can help support the load that's applied to the surface. Uh, tension membrane, so that's a nice idea, but to get enough displacement in the actual uh, geosynthetic, which you'd be putting at the interface between the subgrade and the base core. So to get that, you'd have to have enough displacement in order to get significant vertical component. And that's a little tough because we're not just talking about the displacement of the surface of the road, the surface, uh, where you might have compaction or displacement of the base course. We're actually having to have failure of the subgrade to get enough uh, deflection in our membrane in order to get a vertical component to the tension. So that's a little tough to think of. Filtering, that's another common idea, is that we'll use a woven or maybe an unwoven kind of um, material as a filter. So we'll keep the fines in the subgrade and the coarser material in the base course. We won't let them mix and that'll help us with our strength. Possibly. Uh, it doesn't really help as much if it's a subgrade failure because the subgrade is still the subgrade. And the other thing, if you're building a filter using uh, geosynthetics, you usually have to be pretty careful with the gradation of the material beside the filter. Otherwise, if it's too coarse, then the fines just migrate through the filter, uh, through the the aggregate and then plug your filter and if it's uh, too fine then it just gets in and plugs your filter anyway so filtering is a nice idea but again in practice it has some issues idea of lateral shear so we we're talking about these things and it's a fine grained soil so the subgrade has a clay component how much enough that it is weak and does have an undrained shear strength and so the problem with that when you're looking at footing design is that if you're putting a lateral shear, so across the surface of the subgrade, that'll weaken it. You won't recognize the full undrained shear strength of your soil. So, and you put a load, vertical load up here that puts a, through the soil, puts a lateral stress on the subgrade, which means you can't recognize the full value of your, um, of your undrained shear strength of your fine grained subgrade. So, with uh, putting this geo grid typically in there, you'll wind up, the idea is that you can support this lateral load. And by supporting the lateral load, you can realize the full strength of your subgrade and through that, uh, get a stronger road. That is one that might help. So the idea here is the generic um, uh, base course depth design equation and a number of authors have used the similar format for these and use different parameter groups for lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. They're pretty simple. Lambda 2 is simply the contact stress. Uh, you can make it more complicated or less, but uh, that's what it is. So the stress is applied to the surface of the road. Lambda 1 is to do with that uh, spreading through the uh, base course layer, the load spread angle, or, or a more complicated function if you like, but that's the spread of the load. Lambda 3 is the one which is really the one that you're looking at with the geo grid or geosynthetic. This thing deals with both the um, fatigue of the road, so repeated loading from trucks, and the idea that you're trying to support the lateral shear so you can recognize the full strength of S, which is the undrained shear strength. So these sort of put it in perspective uh, where it works. So recognizing the full value here uh, tends to reduce your required depth. So that's the model people will work with. Here's some actual data that came out from a uh, trafficking trial we did. And if you look at it, uh, this is unreinforced, so no geosynthetic. This is the uh, reinforced with a, a geo grid. And uh, the soil was a fine grain soil in the Fraser Valley up in British Columbia, sort of a cohesive silt, uh, quite weak. And you see with these uh, dots, so uh, the highest one would be the uh, 
white squares here, and that was a 50 centimeter deep gravel layer, all the way down to the little round dots was uh, 25 centimeters. And so again here, this is just showing the two, so the 50 centimeters are the open squares and the closed dots are the 25 centimeters. So that's the depth of the gravel. And when you look at it, you go, well, okay, when you don't have enough gravel, you get accelerated rut depth and eventually failure. Uh, when you have enough gravel, the road will initially rut and then it'll firm up and uh, support the load. And so you go, that's with unreinforced. The same pattern happens with reinforced, it just at a slightly lower rutting uh, level. So for the 50 centimeter reinforced, at eight centimeters rut depth, uh, that's where it kind of levels out. Uh, maybe for the uh, unreinforced, it turns out to be 10 or 12 centimeters. But for most of our forest roads, uh, two or three centimeter rut's not a problem. We just bring out the grader and flatten the road again. So really the difference between these two is becomes uh, less important. And so you start looking at where it ha helps and maybe uh, you wind up having failure, in other words, a, a, an uncontrolled rut, um, stopping at a lower, lower depth of fill. And so with the geograde, you do get a little bit more advantage over here with a, a 30 centimeter uh, base course on top. But what I, my main point is, if you put enough rock on, you will get a road that works with or without the geograde. Uh, and so is the difference between 50 or say maybe if you want to go down to this one, 40 and uh, 30 really going to help you. And when you start looking at the tracks of the machines that we're running on, these roads, uh, 10 centimeters of gravel is not a lot of gravel to be uh, playing with. So other alternatives, uh, there aren't a whole lot of them. One that we tried and I used in Washington State when I was up there and then up in Canada was the idea of mulched wood. So this was a trial we did in Canada. In this trial, we had three road sections. First section had just the local soil, which is what you'd normally be using for in-block roads up there, and you just use it when it's either frozen or dry. So we were trying to find a way of using these roads uh, in the off-season when it was wet. So we had three test roads, and no material on them, so that's just the local soil. Uh, RW20 was mulching the right-of-way material from a 20-meter uh, wide right away and so taking out the merchantable logs and just mulching the waste and RW40 was the uh, 40 meter right away and so it was repeated three times. So you can see we used a harvester that's working on the right of way forming the um, windrow of waste material that's it finished and then you can see the mulcher in there grinding it up and the end result down by my hard hat here you can see is actually a pretty good material when you think of it for a road. It's quite well graded from fine to coarse, um, not a lot of big chunks in it. And it's kind of elongated, so it actually works together. Uh, it doesn't roll around like some chunky ones, uh, depending on the type of grinder you're using. So in this particular project, we got a pretty good material just by running the mulcher up and down the windrow of waste material. You can see, so what happens, we're using a loaded dump truck. So, uh, yeah, had it loaded with rocks, ran it back and forth. We didn't let the dump truck move out of its track, so it had to go up and down a single track. And as you see, a rut starts to form. That was so we could see uh, at what point it would fail. And when we were on the local soil, you couldn't even get one pass. We'd back the truck in, it would get stuck, we'd have to pull it out. And that was true for all three roads. So we got nowhere with the soil. The 20 and the 40 meter right of ways uh, perform pretty good. Uh, when you look at them, this is a section of the 20 and you have a continuous rut, but it's packed in and it's not doing too much. Failure for us, or when we stopped, was when the gravel truck uh, couldn't pass. And that tended to happen at these small local uh, points. And since we didn't let it vary its position, once a local rut formed, a smart person might just move over and, and then not work that rut, and you get more out of the road for that.
but you know, to get the, the truck out in the end, it was pretty easy just to fill the hole with a, a hand shovel and material and the truck would just happily run over it again. But one of the really interesting things about these local ruts, they often formed where the drive axles were trying to push the steering axle over a, a stump. So somewhere behind me here up underneath the truck, there was probably a uh, small stump that we cut flush to the ground as flush as we could. But, you know, as things packed down, there was a little bump there. And so every time the drive axles would have to push it over. So it's that lateral shear problem that we talked about with geosynthetics. It shows up here again. So localized ruts, which would cause failure, overall the roads perform pretty well. Uh, so you can see, maybe if you look at this graph here, the R20s have... Uh, Looking at the different points, these are single average points from the different road segments. Uh, the horizontal uh, axis is the minimum depth of mulch. So in this kind of thing, you don't get a completely uniform layer. And so I looked for the minimum depth and that actually tended to be the most, uh, the strongest predictor of the number of passes we could get out of the gravel truck. So it's a minimum depth, that's the big thing. But again, if you're allowing the uh, operation to either vary their track or to fill the holes, you'd get a lot different performance. But just doing that one thing, just driving up and down, the R40s could easily get over 60 truck passes before localized failure would stop them. Uh, the RW20s could get up to 40 or so. Some were a little bit lower, but that's because there were pockets which would uh, be quite a bit lower in their mulch depth. You can see where the effective depth was, was again up around uh, 15 to 20 centimeters, which if you look back at that uh, trafficking trial with the geosynthetics, that was about where we were as well. Somewhere above 15 and probably 30 with the geosynthetics, you're about the same level. So it's interesting that this uh, parallels that kind of work. So mulch wood does work, but it does form some ruts. Um, this form some ruts and they're localized so they could be fixed but the the speed probably isn't enough so for in block roads it might be a solution but the other part of the problem might be that it could be used as an, in a two-layer road most of our Oregon roads are single so there'll be a subgrade and a, and a capping on top uh, here you could put maybe the mulch in between those two and get a better performance uh, out of a small range of capping and the advantage to the to the mulched wood over putting a geosynthetic in is that if you do cut through these roads, which you probably will if you're working in the winter with some of this machinery, uh, you don't cut into the geosynthetics. And then once you hook onto geosynthetic and pull out of the road, at least partially, it's not like you can poke it back in. So it's a real difficult thing to work with once you've disturbed your geosynthetic. So trying to minimize the gravel over a geosynthetic is a bit of a tough thing for a logging operation. Okay, so moving in, because we're to the end. Uh, conclusions, so rock deposits are a finite resource in Oregon and they're getting uh, more so. I find optimizing road thickness based on truck traffic uh, that forgets about logging uh, does create some problems and limitations. Geosynthetics, uh, they could be used, and I think they are, will, will be, and they are used and will continue to be used, but in very specific situations. They're not a solution that's over going to work over the miles and miles of roads that we have. Uh, mulch wood, as I said, maybe for in-block roads, which don't have uh, high speeds and as much traffic. There's a number of good, good attributes of them, but uh, it is a bit of a, a change in thinking, so that's a bit of a hard jump, but I have used them in Washington and up in British Columbia. Or the idea of having this extra base course layer made out of mulch wood and capping it is an, and another approach that we might try. Okay, I uh, a bit over, but I started late, so there you go. I can take questions now if you like. All right, thank you very much. It was interesting, and uh, I'm also waiting for uh, questions. Uh, maybe our colleagues will write down a question. Yes, I see a question. Can you see it in the public chat panel? Should I go? Our colleague, Professor Bors, asked you a question. If you could answer. Actually, there are two, two questions. 
Sorry, I'm not sure if I'm on the talk. Oh, Stellan? I, okay. I, could read them. I, I will read them for you if you oh, can. Oh, I think I see it. Okay, given the rock scarcity, do you see any other roading solutions for the wrong, long term? Well, the one we use now is we, we do have dry summers, and maybe climate change is helping us because we're getting longer, drier summers. So can you use the local soil in the summer without a capping? And we do do that. So in that, that respect, I guess uh, climate change might be helping out. So using less rock by having more of your in-block or shorter roads just being a, a soil surface. They don't get a frozen road here the way we do in British Columbia, so they can't make so much uh, use of that in the winter. So there's that way. Uh, as I said, a couple of choices I had here, but that's kind of where you're at. I don't think paving the roads works so well here. We don't, we're not on the roads that often. Well, we are on the roads, but it's not so continuous. And then to actually build the subgrade to a level that the pavement doesn't um, settle and start to crack. Uh, the US Forest Service paved some uh, of their roads and they've had a lot of problems with settlement. And so what do you do other than have to dig the whole road up and start over again? At least with a gravel road, when it settles, you can uh, regrade it and it's not as much of a problem. So I don't see paving being a long-term issue. Unless we really wanna invest in building, rebuilding all of our roads, which isn't gonna happen right now. Uh, current uh, dent road density and where should it be? How many meters per hectare? I don't have that answer, but I'd say on the coast, uh, their history has been skyline logging. And so as much as possible, they don't have more road than they need in the coast range. Uh, a little different in some of the other spots, but in the coast range, you probably have about the least amount of road that you're gonna use. And since a lot of it's private land and you're on the land uh, year after year, you're not really gonna pull up roads for 60 years and, and use that rock somewhere else. Um, so I think, I think probably you'd look at Oregon and go, okay, the road density is not overly dense and it probably has to be about like that. If we go more into ground-based, you might find uh, All right. to put more road in. Thank you very much. And I also have a short question, uh, not dealing with roads, uh, uh, but uh, with soil erosion. You've said that it's a problem with those uh, roads with no surface, uh, because it's not possible to uh, extract uh, wood or to, let's say, make the uh, transport in uh, rainy periods. But uh, is there any soil erosion occurring on those uh, denuded tracts? Because I expect so. Sorry, what was this last part? Soil erosion. If soil erosion occurs on those, uh, yeah, yeah. You do the so, tracks. so two things about it. I, I think with the soil roads, the ones that are made without gravel on them, when it rains, they're just impassable for heavy traffic. So it's not so much a erosion would be bad, but the problem is, is that you just can't travel on them. Uh, so. That's that's a no, but as I, I mean erosion when uh, there's no uh, traffic on on the road. The road oh. is still exposed at the raindrops and uh, maybe some uh, runoff or overland flow concentrating on those uh, tracks. It could be, uh, but that picture I showed, you know, of uh, of uh, some of the Oregon soils, uh, the these soils they're deep and they actually drain the water. It goes quite deep. It doesn't build up the way I'm used to in British Columbia. We don't have impermeable later layers. So you don't get a lot of water coming out of the bank. What you right. get the is, falling is quite high. I see. that tends not to, um, it's, I mean, there's steep roads and you do have erosion or washouts for sure, but it's not quite the same as I'm used to seeing on coastal BC. I see. One thing you do get for sediment discharge is the rock here, partly because it's um, uh, volcan effusive, so it's not granite, wasn't cool underneath, it's surface cool rock, so it's finer grained and often it's a bit weaker. Plus they crush it, which gives it, you know, a fractured edge. So it wears and produces sediment itself. And so you get a fair bit of sediment discharge just coming out of the gravel that you've put on top of the roads. All right, thank you very much. And uh, Kevin, 
Thanks again for your efforts to stay late in night or earth to wake up early in the morning at three o'clock or even earlier to join us in this uh, uh, symposium. Thank you very much. We appreciate your effort and uh, I can't express more my gratitude. Thank you. It was fun. It was a good talk today. I, I was interested in all the present present presentations. So uh, that was a good way to spend my evening. Now I'm going to get a couple hours of sleep and lecture in uh, three or four hours from now, I think. So. All, all right. Thank you very much again. Take care. Thank you. All right, so uh, I have to say it was a very interesting uh, plenary session. The shame it was online. I do hope we could uh, meet all the keynote speakers again in uh, normal conditions. But uh, indeed, I could say all the presentations were um, capturing our attention. Uh, and uh, I have to thank all the keynote speakers for, uh, for their um, contribution. It was also a wide uh, range of uh, forestry topics that was uh, covered, coming from uh, uh, genetics that could uh, be very important in uh, dynamic forest conservation in a changing environment and for mitigating uh, the possible climate change. Uh, then uh, we've had also a more traditional approach in forestry offered by Professor uh, Speaker, and we, uh, got, we've um, uh, ended to space forestry. You could say it by making a joke uh, referring to space, space in the most sense forest. Uh, also, there were um, interesting um, contributions referring to this, uh, let's say, new paradigm of uh, forest ecosystem management that is currently replacing the traditional uh, silviculture approach. Maybe or maybe not, uh, but the contribution of Professor Heinemann was very interesting by stressing on the, let's say, the new uh, issues in uh, modern forestry. Uh, we are in contact with uh, different uh, other uh, sectors and scientific uh, domains like uh, complexity uh, theory and so on. Uh, also, um, we appreciate very much the contribution of um, uh, Professor Petanella about uh, evaluating the cultural services. And that's our invitation. We hope that as soon as possible, all of you, the keynote speakers, will come to Brasov for some forest bathing. Uh, we do hope so as soon as, uh, as possible. Uh, we also want to thank uh, to our audience. It was uh, an important uh, audience. And we do hope that it was possible for uh, all people to um, uh, pick up interesting information and to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, end up with a useful uh, uh, morning. As compared with our courses, when sometimes we have doubts if all the connected uh, people are uh, really connected <laughs> with us and uh, attentive, I think that uh, since it was a voluntary, uh, optional uh, decision to join our conference, all those connected were really active and uh, attentive. So thank you very much again for the audience as well. Now we are going to have a lunch break. I have to apologize again, it's only a virtual lunch break. But uh, I think you'll find uh, ways to, let's say, uh, solve this problem by, uh, by yourself. We promise to, uh, let's say, uh, pay back uh, at our uh, next uh, conference in, uh, in Brasov. Uh, and uh, certainly, you saw the program, the agenda. Uh, we will uh, join uh, together in the parallel sessions uh, starting at, um, uh, let me see, at um, uh, 2.30 p.m. So at uh, 14 hours and 30 minutes, we'll join together online, obviously, uh, but not here in the plenary session, but you will have to use the links provided uh, and indicating the agenda for each parallel session. Okay, thank you very much again for your attention. Thank you very much for your contribution and hope to see you as soon as possible here in Brasov. All the best wishes from Brasov.